This is Jocko Podcast number 277. With Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. It is again impressed upon every officer and man of this command that ground once captured must under no circumstances be given up in the absence of direct, positive, and formal orders to do so, emanating from these headquarters. Troops occupying ground must be supported against counterattack and all gains held. It is a favorite trick of the Germans to spread confusion by calling out retire or fall back. If in action any such command is heard, officers and men may be sure that it is given by the enemy. Whoever gives such a command is a traitor, and it is the duty of any officer or man who is loyal to his country and who hears such an order given to shoot the offender upon the spot. We are not going back, but forward. So came the order from Major General Robert Alexander on the morning of September 26th, 1918. At the beginning of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, World War I. A few days later, October 1st, Major Charles White Whittlesey was given his orders. He was to advance north up uh, the Argonne Ravine, go across a brook, and take Charlevoix Mill. And the purpose was to get control of this mill from which a nearby road and a nearby rail line could be controlled. And once they had that completed, they were to push on to Hill 198 to, be, to complete a flanking maneuver on the enemy. This assault started on October 2nd. The men woke up ate breakfast and commenced to fighting. By the evening of October 2nd, Major Whittlesley got reports that his men had found a way up Hill 198. So they attacked, got control of the hill. Got control of the hill with men from battalions of the 307th and 308th Infantry Regiments of the 154th Infantry Brigade, 77th Division. Now, once he got control of this hill, didn't receive any communication from the French unit that was supposed to be protecting his left flank and no communication from an American unit that was supposed to be protecting his right flank. And it's World War One. there's no radios or anything where the flanks had collapsed. He didn't know this, but the Germans had taken the ground. Whittlesley and his men dug in, created a defensive position on that hill, which became known as the Pocket. At about 22.30 that night, Whittlesley realized the Germans were on Hill 205 and they were in the ravine off to his right. The morning of October 3rd, Whittlesley sent out runners to his flanks to establish communications, find out where these American and French units were. That's what you did in World War I when you know what was happening. You didn't have radios to call, so you sent runners or you sent carrier pigeons. So he sends out the runners to the left and right flank. None of them come back. Sends carrier pigeons with various messages about their position and situations. Receives no communication back. And he comes to the realization that they must be completely surrounded. On the afternoon of October 3rd, the Germans attacked from all sides. One of the American company commanders, a guy named Captain Holderman, led a breakout to try and connect with Allied forces, took massive casualties, and the breakout was stopped so they're surrounded and stuck. 
and the Germans attacked with mortars to get the heads down and then got closer and attacked with grenades. Then the Americans held. And as evening approached, the Germans backed off because while the Germans were assaulting, not only did they cause massive casualties, they received massive casualties. On the morning of 4 October, the Major, Major Whittlesley was worried that no one knew what his situation was. There was massive casualties. And then they begin getting shelled. But they begin getting shelled by their own artillery. And he has one last carrier pigeon left, and he launches it. And this last carrier pigeon arrives at headquarters. It's been shot through the breast. It's been blinded in one eye, and it's got one leg hanging on by a tendon. And the message says, we are along the road parallel to 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. So the artillery stops. And then the Germans attack again. And they're driven back once again. And there's, again, mass casualties on both sides. Except for that the Americans are running low on ammunition. They don't have any food. The one water source that they had close by exposed them to German fire. And so this continues on the 5th and the 6th of October. Attack after attack, the wounded and the dead pile up. And on the 7th of October, the Germans send a blindfolded American POW forward carrying a a white flag. And he has a note with him. And the note is directed to the commanding officer of the Americans. And it says, the suffering of your wounded men can be heard over here in the German lines. And we are appealing to your humane sentiments to stop. A white flag shown by one of your men will tell us that you agree with these conditions. Please treat Private Lowell R. Hollingshead, the bearer of this note, as an honorable man. He's quite a soldier. We envy you. Signed, the German commanding officer. And Major Whittlesley allegedly replied, You go to hell. So they hunkered down and they braced for more attacks. And then that night, a relief force arrived and the Germans finally retreated. And of the 554 troops that originally attacked that hill, 190 were wounded, 63 were missing, and 107 were killed. Only 194 were able to walk out. They became known as the Lost Battalion. There were seven medals of honor awarded for this action, including one to Major Charles Charles W. Whittlesley, who was immediately promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. And if you are tracking the dates here, this was in October of 1918, and the war ended a little over a month later, November 11th, 1918, and this became, in America, one of the most publicized events of the war. So the war ends in November of 1918. In 1919, 
there's a movie ca- came out. The movie was called The Lost Battalion. Whittlesley himself was in the film playing himself. And it's a silent film. You can go watch it. You can see, you can see him. You can see him reenacting these events. And he tried to go back to civilian life. He's now out of the army and he's smart and he's educated and he's has a law degree from Harvard and he had his own law partnership before the war. But obviously things had changed. And the one thing that had changed was he was, you know, a movie star and a hero and there was this constant demand for speeches and there were parades for him and interviews and it started to wear on him. And in November of 1921, he served as a pallbearer at the burial of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. And a few days later, he booked a trip on a ship from New York to Havana, a ship called the SS Toloa. And he set sail on November 26th 1921 and that night he had dinner he chatted with some people about 11 30 that night he left for his stateroom and in the morning the stewards knocked on his door to go into his cabin and no one answered so they entered his cabin so they could clean And they found a note. And the note said, to the captain of the SS Taloa, Dear Sir, my name is Charles W. Whittlesey, 14 Wall Street, New York City. I'm enclosing some money and my watch. Please give $10 to each of the deck stewards, the room stewards, and the table steward. Deduct what is necessary for sending the enclosed wireless messages and send my balance to my executor, John B. Pruin, 2 Rector Street, New York City. Please throw my suitcases and clothes overboard. I don't want anything returned. And I'm writing my father that I'm making this request of you. Here are the messages I would very much appreciate you sending. One, Frank R. Whittlesley, 38 Pomeroy Avenue, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Your son, Charles Whittlesley, jumped overboard and was drowned yesterday. He left letters for you, mailed from Havana, and notifying Pruin and Elisha Whittlesley. Two, John B. Pruin, 2 Rector Street, New York City. Charles Whittlesley jumped overboard and was drowned yesterday. He left a letter for you that will be mailed from Havana. I am notifying his father, Frank Whittlesley, and his brother, Elisha Whittlesley. Elisha Whittlesley, 136 East 44th Street, New York City. Your brother, Charles Whittlesley, jumped overboard and was drowned yesterday. He left a letter for you that will be mailed from Havana. I am notifying your father and John B. Pruin. And number four, Robert F. Little, 14 Wall Street, New York City. Look in your upper left-hand drawer of my desk for memorandum of law matters that I've been attending to. I shall not return. Will you so kindly mail these letters? I am leaving. I am very sorry to bother you with these unpleasant details. Signed, Charles W. Whittlesley.
his body was never recovered. And they put a stone for him in the military cemetery in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, that reads, in memory of Charles W. Whittlesley, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, World War I, 1884 to 1921. Medal of Honor. And that's that. A hero and a tragedy, and you can't help but ask yourself, how does this happen? How does a story of heroism and camaraderie and courage, how does that turn into a story of despair and loneliness and loss of hope? And what can we learn from that story? How can we learn to avoid that tragedy? And move away from the darkness and move toward the light. And here tonight to discuss that with us is one of the few people in the world that can have some semblance of understanding of that story, of what Colonel Whittlesley went through. His name is Dakota Meyer, and if you don't know who he is, then just stop listening right now and go listen to podcast number 115. Dakota Meyer is a Marine, he's a sniper, he's a father, he's a recipient of the Medal of Honor. He's one of my heroes, and most important, he's one of my friends. Dakota, thanks for coming down, man. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> man, that's a, um, that, you know, that hits home. You know, I was listening to the last time you were on this podcast, and we, we, we basically kind of closed it out after you received the Medal of Honor. Mm-hmm. I mean, we went just a little bit past it, but... You know, since then, we, you know, you and I have talked about things that are going on and what it was like after that. And you know, as I, I and as I read through that story of Colonel Whittlesley, you can see there's 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 definite parallels. Oh, I mean, it's uh, yeah. I mean, like I like while you were reading it, like I, um, I mean, like I was like tearing up because like I like I could just I could feel how lonely that guy was you know it's a yeah I mean you know how do you yeah I mean there's like what do you do the rest of your life you know like what do you what do you do the rest of your life you know like yeah you can keep going and giving back but it's also a lonely road because you know everybody's sitting here just first off you don't know why they're around you you know and then you don't know and everybody loves to just like they just want to watch you fail you know what I mean so that they can in their mind make themselves feel better and it's like everything you do is criticized and I just I mean just with how that guy did it it's just he he did it on his terms you know, it's like, it's, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lonely road. I mean, it's a lonely road and it's not just a, it's not just, yeah, I mean, I'm nothing special. I don't look at myself as anything, as anything special. I, I did what I trained to do. I did what I put hope into to people to do if they were in that situation. But, you know, it's just and it's I, and honestly i think it's even worse today with everybody being able to 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 watch how you live your life like more people have their eyes on you right like like you know you get a guy who goes out and and deals with ptsd or whatever he's struggling that day 
I mean, I'm scared. I, like, I won't even go. Like, I remember when I, when I call my doctors, if I need to go talk to somebody, a therapist or something, like, I come up with a route of how I can go in the back door so nobody sees me so that they can publicize, oh, look, look, there's Dakota going, like, there's something wrong with him. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just a, the, 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 the standards are not, they're not, the, the ground's not equal now. And it's just a, yeah, I mean, but also, like, you, you, you get, you get a choice. Every day is a choice. And it's like, Am I going to take this and try to give back and continue using the things that made me successful in that moment and apply it somewhere else? You know, like the most fulfillment I get is my daughters and and whatever I'm trying to help people as a firefighter. Like it's been the best thing for me. Like I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, I, um, there was this guy and I, I, I talk about it in the book, there was this, it was one of the first times I felt, if I felt real again almost and, um, I'd help this guy and he didn't know who I was. He didn't know me for what I'd done. He didn't know my name. I was just a guy in a uniform and there when he needed help. And he like thanked me and was so appreciative. And I was like, that feels good. That feels good. He didn't have any any assumption of who I was or how I was, you know what I mean? Like that guy just needed that moment and I could be there for him. And it shows me that I still got it, that I still got it. You know, because, I mean, you get off and, like, how long do you get out of the military? We've talked about this. How long do you get out of the military and you can still you can still walk around with this, I'm a warrior, but you haven't even had to get in the ring? How long does that credibility still give you, I'm a warrior today? Not I was a warrior, but I am a warrior. How long do you get that credibility without getting in the ring? You know, mm-hmm. and it's always a struggle. That's always a struggle is, do I still have it? Could I still do it? Could I still perform at that level? Because at the day you can't, you have to say I was a warrior. You know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I mean, you have to be tested. And that's the one thing you talk to David Goggins, like that guy, he tests himself all the time. He's always pushing it. Mm-hmm. But but that's like, yeah, I mean, that's the struggle is, is like, could I still like, and, and like it, the further I get away from that day in Afghanistan, you know, like I question myself all the time of, did I, how could I have done that that day? But like today I don't, today I can't even, you know, get myself to have enough discipline to go work out. What happened to me? Do you know? So when you get when you get done, like how long did it take for the for the damn ceremonies and the round of interview? I remember, I remember you and I were talking on the phone. I, I forget when, but you were talking about like you were on sixty minutes. You were on all the like every what freaking Letterman. You did yeah. everything. Yeah. How long did that did that last for? You know, like I was, st- I was like, it was really crazy, all the way, all the way up to. I got it in sep- September fifteenth of two thousand eleven. Through December, it was crazy. I mean, I was on The View, sixty minutes, CBS Sunday Morning, Fox all the time. I was on, um, um, obviously Letterman, um, Jay Leno. I mean, you go Just down everything. You go down down the list. And it was, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, it was crazy, and. Um, it's still like speeches kept going like I mean you still walk out places and people recognize you and you know everybody's coming at you and wanting you and this and that and and it was it took me like I hated it I was I mean I, when I hear people say hey I met you back in two but anytime I'm like when did you meet me if it was between 2011 and 2014 I'm, I apologize first thing I say is I'm sorry I'm sorry I was drunk the whole time I hated it like I hated it like there would be times that like so I had a whole team around me. The Marine Corps sent, like right after they announced I was getting the medal, the Marine Corps sent out like seven people to live with me 24-7. What were they <laughs> like? I had a, what were they doing? I had, a, like, I had a security guy that stayed in my house. Like he stayed with, I, never, like I, I wasn't anywhere by myself for probably 90 days at least, 120 days. And... A guy live a guy live with me. Um, they sent in like 
There were PR people, mm-hmm. PAO people. Like there was three of them. Um, and you're 23 years old. 23 years old. I was tie and steel. There's there's <laughs> there's interviews. You go on the internet and there's interviews of. So they sent divots out, right? So like the the DOD, the Marine Corps, like combat camera people, like capturing this. There are images of like I'm like I refuse. I'm like no, it's not changing my life. And I'm literally on a skid steer, like working under a skid steer, and they're interviewing me because they had to get something, and I would not stop. <laughs> I'm like, no, you can follow me, but that's it. So they would get up and follow me to go work at yards and stuff all day long. But yeah, I mean, so I had all that, and I mean, it was just like a, a, a you know, my whole life changed, and and then you know, it like everything was good. It's like they built me up. Like I was, I couldn't do anything wrong. And it's like when they got you to the top of the mountain, it was like the pinata they raise up. And then it was just like, here came the media just as soon as you said something wrong. Or, I mean, they were just, it's the gotchas. And it was like, it was like they just build you up to just try to smash you down, right? And there was always this one reporter who was there um, that just always wanted to take me to task. So it's like you just got, you had to, you just start, you take these beatings, right? And, and like it does, like people are like, oh, who cares? Who cares what they say about you? Well, there's only one thing I've got in this life, and that's my name and reputation. That's the only, like when I die on my tombstone, it's not going to have any of my awards. It's not going to have anything but the day I was born and the day I died, and it's going to say Meyer at the top of it. And that's what people are going to know. That's my brand. And so I took it serious. Like when I would come home and, I remember I landed one night and uh, I landed real late in Louisville and I was driving home and uh, the Courier Journal had released on the front page across the state because I remember I pulled into this gas station in my hometown and it was across the state and it was Medal of Dishonor with my page on the front page of the state paper, right? And they were trying to discredit everything that I had done. and. Um, it was so bad that like my friends got up, like they found out about it and they got up and they went and bought all the papers out in town. And it was just always something, man. And it's just like, you you just can't, there's no rhyme or reason to it, you know? And, and it's just, a, yeah, I mean, it, you get isolated. So I get, I get what that guy said, you know, what that guy did. Um, Cause I mean, sometimes you just, you know, what, if I can't help people and make a difference, what am I doing? What, what are you doing? So you say the, like the hype train lasted from September to December. And I mean, at some point does all of a sudden those seven Marines that were there watching your every move all of a sudden, like their, their duties over, mm-hmm. we got Meyer done with whatever he needed to get done. Yeah. And then. Like one day you wake up and like you're alone. Yeah, so we were supposed to go to, so we did a East Coast, West Coast, and we we're supposed to do a Hawaii tour. So it's like a, we were like a week in, in New York, and then a week in California, and then we were supposed to go to Hawaii for like a week to do press and all this, right? See the bases and um, do the press on each coast. And uh, we went to New York, did that. So like I got the medal, came home. And then the week after that, I was. This is when all this started. And uh, by the time I hit California, I'm like, I'm out. Like I, I on the plane to California from New York to California, I said, I can't. I'm, I'm out. I can't keep doing this. Um, and so that was it. Like they all. What was on. it that made you feel you could? You like? Did the people just constantly talking to you? I mean, was it just you feel like you're put up on a pedestal? And yeah. we talked about this the first time you were on here. I mean, basically everyone's saying. Hey, yeah. good job. I mean, you got to take this. Like, I am literally known for the biggest failure of my life. Like, you you can't change the narrative to, like, like that's where people get wrong is they're like, well, like, they justify stuff in their head. The facts are this. Like, you can't change the facts. All my team is dead. Like, I didn't get them out, whether whether it was rational or not. Somebody can say, I'm going to do 10,000 push-ups today. 
and they're trying to break a Guinness Book of World Record. Nobody looks at him and says, "Well, you 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 did you did 500 an hour. That's that's good enough." They failed. I failed. My teammates are dead. Their families has unanswered questions. There's, you know, there's there's four kids that will never see their dad. And I'm getting paraded around the nation as a hero. And it's like I look at all these other medal, of, like all the other Medal of Honor guys, and and I, I I'm away from them because you know I, I get look Kyle Carpenter. I couldn't imagine what that kid gone through. Like you talk about a guy that's a warrior. That kid's a warrior. I don't have anything like that. And but I tell these I tell these guys that like you guys you guys did some badass stuff. You guys did badass stuff. And you got some guys to enjoy it with. I come home, I ain't got anybody. And it's literally the biggest failure of my life. Now, with that, I've learned a lot. But I can't change the narrative because it doesn't feel good. And you started you started feeling this way while you're flying from New York to California. Well, I, I mean, I, I told the president that I couldn't accept the medal. I wanted him to break it down to a Navy Cross. I told him I couldn't accept the medal because... Like he said, you're a hero. I'll never forget. President Obama told me that I was a hero. And I said, if you think I'm such a hero, why don't you call my teammates up and get their opinion? Go let them know I'm a hero. And I, I'm not. And that's why, like, that's why when these people are, like, trying to discredit or they're trying to say, oh, you know, whatever, I mean, I can't argue with them. I, 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 you talk about getting my ass kicked. Like I got a medal of honor for getting my ass kicked. And so I just, I couldn't keep living this in the media of like, it it just, it was, it was a hard thing. Like I just wasn't there yet. Right now I don't do it about me. I do it about my teammates. Right. Like I do it to try to show these lessons of if, Hey, you know, I I come to this point to where I wasn't going to change it. I wasn't going to be able to get away from it. You know, it was like, and so how do I use it to make a difference? How do I try to turn something so terrible into something good? And that's what I ended up having to do. But yeah, I got off like on the plane to, it was on the plane to LA. It was on the plane from New York to LA. And I remember looking at the girl who was running all my stuff. She was, she's a rock star. You talk about a girl who, she is a rock star. And um, I said, I, I, we were done. We're done. We'll finish these interviews here, but we're not going to Hawaii. And I'm going home. And landed. We did the stuff we had to do in, in uh, L.A. I flew home from there. And then, um, I mean, I was still doing events and still doing what people wanted me to. I was I had a scholarship fund with the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation. I had this challenge to America where we would raise a million dollars to put kids through college. So, like, I was going out speaking at events for that to, like, go into – private dinners to where somebody would write a huge check to to the scholarship foundation so I was doing that and then yeah no I didn't have any nobody taught me what I should do what I shouldn't do you know they it was like uh 23 years old just thrown to this machine that I, I mean I, I didn't even have an Instagram at the time right like I didn't I didn't know what to do and um so yeah, I mean, I did that. I was on the speaking, like I did speaking with leading authorities. Um, broke my book with Being West in 2012. And you know, like speeches kept going and like events and things like that. And, um, but you just kind of, just kind of going with the flow of what's next, right? And yeah, I did some. Well, it was the Marine Corps when you said, hey, look, I'm not going to Hawaii, We're, I'm done, I'm done. Was the Marine Corps thinking, of, or did anybody say, okay, Hey, maybe we need to give Dakota some like help yeah. to get through this because he's got a massive amount of guilt over what happened. Did, did anybody talk to you along those lines at all? So the Marine Corps didn't know what to do either, right? Like I was the first living Marine since Vietnam to receive the Medal of Honor. So they weren't really schooled up on it either. And um, there was one mistake that they made uh, and from the beginning is, um, and they tried to put it together, but when they put the narrative together, this is what opened us up to the media, to the, the, um, 
the guy who actually was the reporter that was actually the one that just was trying to discredit everything. And this was his heart. This this was a piece he honed on. But like in the in the first initial write up they had to do, right? They put numbers in of how many people were rescued or say whatever you want to call it, and how many people I killed, which opened it up to numbers. Mm-hmm. Which A doesn't matter. And B opens it up, right? Because it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Did you did you kill twenty eight people or seventy two people or one hundred and seventy two people? It's like it's all. It doesn't really matter. Wait, it wait. And did you save? Because you can get a medal of honor for saving one person. Mm-hmm. You can get a medal of honor for for killing one person. Yeah. You can get a medal of honor for saving a hundred or killing a hundred. It's that's not what it's about. Yeah. But if they open it up for that, all of a sudden they make it matter. Mm-hmm. And that's. And that was where it messed up, and I think that, like there started that the negative stuff started coming out, and that was where. But like the reporter even says in his article, there's an article out there about it. Like, well, there's quite a few, but he even states he goes, um, he was, um, he states all these things, these discrepancies, but he goes. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve yeah. it. I actually read that article yeah. yesterday. Yeah, he said he says something along the lines of. Not that these actions alone don't fully warrant the Medal of Honor. Yeah. So what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. God. So it's those things that like, you know, a guy like me and like you, you have, you've had to talk me down. A guy like me, all I've known my whole life, like the, the, I'm not, there's only one thing I'm good at and it's fighting. It's all I know. Like I have been, it's all I know. You know what I mean? Like, it's the only thing that's made me successful at anything is that I was willing to fight and I was willing to work. And you put those things in a spot where there's there's people who are poking, it's not a good, it's not a good thing, right? And, and so, like, I had to back up, ref, you know, get myself together. I was drinking too much. Like I was just trying to deal with all of it. I mean, I mean, imagine walking into a room and everybody wants to talk to you about the worst day of your life, like over and over and over. And it's like, you don't have to, it's not about going home and not dreaming about it. It's about I'm walking into rooms and I'm sitting here literally reliving it over and over and over, which, which is, is okay. Um, but I just, I just think that like, sometimes the worst day of my life is somebody else's entertainment. I, I wish I would have pulled this quote, um, major Whittlesley, he was at like a dinner and spoke at the dinner. He sits down with his friends and they, the friends were talking and they said something along the lines of, he said exactly what you just said, exactly what you just said. He said something along the lines of every time I talk about mm-hmm. this, I go right back there mm-hmm. and I can't get away from it. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah, I mean I just I mean look, I'm I still today I miss my guys. I mean, you know, I I just seen that one of my like uh one of my teammates his his daughter's a, you know, she's about to have a baby. And you know, you just it's just it's crazy. You know what I mean? It's like well, I get to sit here and enjoy my two beautiful daughters, who are more than I ever deserve. I get to I get to hang around such amazing people, and I get to live a beautiful life, and and all these things. And you know, it's just it's not a, it's not a fair world. You know, it's not. And that's that was always a thing, you know, a struggle for me to deal with. And you know, and how do you give back? How do you continue to give back? Right? Like what? Look, I mean, I, yeah, how do you get back, right? So, yeah, so, like, the Marine Corps left. They went on their own way. Honestly, they kind of separated from me. I didn't hear much from them again. Uh, probably two and a half, two, two and a half years. I didn't hear much from them. It was, like, mission complete for them. It was like, hey, let's separate from this because I don't know if this thing's going to be a hand grenade or, you know, what's going to happen. Isn't it weird? You know, you said earlier, like, for for this guy – you said it's worse today, right? Because everyone, there's, you know, word travels so fast and all this stuff. But you would think, man, like, at least people understand the concept of 
survivor guilt and post-traumatic stress. Like at least we understand those things. And yet it seems like, you know, if I, when someone goes through something like this, you, you gotta like give them some support, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, but you know, like how do you do that when everybody looks at you like a hero? You, you, do you, how, how many times have you been in a situation with, with a group of people knowing damn well that you all, you are all as scared as it gets. And, but it's like, as long as you keep your poker face on, you could literally be the thing that breaks them where everybody's going to be like, no, you just confirmed their fears or you, you are the thing that keeps them going. And, and you know, I, I just always took it as this is my, um, I got the medal and that's my punishment for letting my teammates get killed. This is my punishment to be paraded in front of all the people as a hero, the exact opposite of what I am. And it, that was, that was my punishment. That was what the universe or God, whoever you want to think about it, this was, this was what I got for failing that day. And that was, that was kind of how it was, you know? And so like anytime I got to give a speech or talk to people and tell them the realities of it, you know, I just wanted them to know that, hey, look, you can get your ass kicked and get back up from it. And that's what the story is. My story is not a story of a guy who is some high speed, low drag, you know, my story is a story of a guy who got his ass kicked and has had his ass kicked his whole life and has, has, who, who lives a life of success he has found a way to make success out of a shit ton of failures. And that's kind of that's kind of what it is, you know? But yeah, the Marine Corps went away and then I started hiring my own people. You when know, you say like, hiring your own people, what kind of people? So like I had I had agents, right? So I had a book agent, a uh, book and movie agent um, with ICM, Sloan, Sloan Harris was a great guy. Um, I had, you know, obviously with the speaking agency, um, I had, I had security people like that I would keep on me and not really for anything other than to protect me from myself. Right. Like, cause you know, I walked in, I mean, I, I would walk in somewhere and like, we'd be drinking and somebody would say something and I would hit them. And you know what? That's a lawsuit now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I had, you know, assistants. I mean, you know, people who would like, kind of handle me to get me to where I needed to be. I mean, it was it was it was a crazy it was a crazy time. I mean, it was crazy, and um, that was all the way up until probably 2014, and then and then it just I kind of just I was like I, I just want to get away from it, and I started backing off. And you know, I was so fortunate that I've been with Toyota since 2011, mm -hmm. and you know, you talk about Ed Laukas, and you talk about Don Esmond, and you talk about like all these these incredible people inside of Toyota, like these people like met me and. Um, They've mentored me the whole way. Like you talk about sticking with me through thick and thin and believing in a cause of, 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 you know, of helping veterans and just I, like you take them out of, out of, you know, if I hadn't met them in 2000, you know, 2012, there's no telling where I'd be. So those guys were kind of helping you guide, guide you through all this. Yeah. And former Marines? Uh, so Don Esmond was a, a Marine. He was in Vietnam, a pilot in Vietnam. He was a medevac pilot. Um, so he's got oh, over 900 missions, shot down, Silver Star recipient. I mean, but he was um, he was the, uh, I think he was the COO of Toyota. And um, we, you know, I, I got in contact with him and, they brought me on as they were, they, they got with this uh, program called Hiring Our Heroes that I mm -hmm. work with and, and helping veterans get back to work and and um, but but it was more personal for them. It wasn't a business thing for mm -hmm. them. Like they took me in and then Don, or, uh, you know Ed Laukas, his mom and dad both were in World War II mm -hmm. and uh, Marines and so it was just like it was crazy how I got there to them and they you know gosh you talk about 2011 2012 Dakota. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is that when you were the hand grenade that the Marine Corps was oh. scared you were? <laughs> oh. Listen, you, you, you take those people out of my life, you know, John Lisko, um, and they didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just find these people. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, the, when you say these people, like, helped you out, I, there's always people that ask me, um, hey, how can we help veterans? And you know, it's really easy to say like give to charity, which is awesome for sure. But in terms of what, what, what is helpful and what you're talking about is like actually form relationships mm -hmm. with people so that you can see where you can help them and you can provide them the help and support that they need. Yeah, There's a big difference between me writing a check and saying, okay, I feel better about myself because I wrote a check to whatever foundation, which again, that's good. Mm -hmm. But if you wanna go next level, Form some relationships with some people. And, and look, veterans have, especially like you, like me when I was young, right? You have no, I didn't really have any experience in the world, right? I was institutionalized. It was just, I just knew the military, that's me, that's my life. So if I would have gotten out when I was 23, 24 years old, I wouldn't know what to do. So someone that's a civilian, that's a little older, if you form a relationship with someone, and look, I can tell you, it's not going to be easy. Oh, no. I can almost guarantee that being trying to mentor and guide 23 year old Dakota, oh. there's going to be challenges. Like, it's like having a freaking teenage boy yep. that's old enough to drink and has money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and, and that was it, right? Like, you know, it, you talk about Ed. I mean, I go back, I keep talking about Ed Laucus, and like, you, you talk about a guy who just. I mean, he was like, I mean, he was like a second dad, you know what I mean? Like he, you know, his wife, Karen, just, I mean, I actually, I just called her mom, you know? And you, you talk about any, any, I mean, just, they went out of their way and I was so lucky. But, you know, that's the one thing that I have to say, if I've ever been good at, you know, all the way growing up, I've always been able to find um, great, like I've always had this way of, of finding great people and, and knowing who good people were, who I should try to be like, I was really good at figuring those out and, and making them believe in me. Right. Like I was, that, that's the only, th that's the only power I really have is, is that I can, I know who I, who's, who's really good in the room and who's, who's, who I should be like. And I find a way to get them to help get me there. And then always having great mentors. I've had that from day one, um, I've, I've been I've been so fortunate to have that, right? And that's what's got me, I mean, even still today, even still today, that's the pieces that keep me going and keep getting me better and keep helping me grow and learn and develop, you know? And that's that's been my key to, to, to success or whatever you call it, to, to still being here, right? Um, is those people. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a product of the people who who are around me, they should get the credit for any successes I have, you know, and that's how it is. So when you, when you uh, in the book in, Into the Fire, you, you, I mean, you had the lowest of low points, right? You're in your freaking truck and, and yeah. you're, you basically try and kill yourself, but luckily someone uh, pulled around out of the, pulled around out of the chamber, so your, your weapon wasn't chambered, round wasn't chambered then you get the medal then you're on like a there's a little lift you're getting the medal you're getting all this attention mm -hmm. do you go back down to a low point mm -hmm. at some point yeah yeah i mean t i mean i think like if yeah yeah i mean it's 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 always like a it's like a roller coaster i mean i don't know what it causes it you know what i mean like there's some days i wake up and i'm just like man i don't even want to get out of bed like i don't even want to get out of bed and um I, why I don't know, but yeah, I mean, after I got the medal, I was in the lowest of lows. I mean, it was the lowest of lows. Mm. I mean, it was just I would literally like I'll never forget this one time. It was actually going to my speaking agency. Uh, well, you you talk about the day the the president called me to come have a beer with him. Like we're I was standing. I can remember I was standing speaking to some Marines. Um, I won't say where, but I was speaking to some Marines at an event, and I, I mean I was hammered. Like it was probably nine, ten a.m. in the morning, and I'm not talking about like buzzed. I'm talking about like Dakota was drunk, 
<laughs> um, I would get up in the morning before interviews, like the six, five, six a.m. interviews, and I'd be taking shots on the way to the studio. Um, and like I was standing there, and I'll never forget, like whenever they said for me to come over and have a drink. Um, this so the the girl who used to take care of me, her name is Jeanette. Jeanette looked at me, and like her face like melted. She's like. I hope they don't give you sobriety tests before you go in. Like, we have to sober you up. She literally started making me pound waters mm-hmm. to try to get me sober enough to go into the White House. And, I mean, that was how I lived. Like, I just, I couldn't, like, I hated it. I couldn't take it, you know. And, and I mean, I could, but I just, I just hated what it was about. It wasn't about the work or about the workload. It was just I was literally just living uh, this, this nightmare. And, um, you know, they were rock stars. And... Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was a shit show. So how, how how long did you stay in that mode for? Probably until like 2014. And then what what happened in 2014? Did you did you realize something? What happened? Um, I just I stayed like I kind of I kind of seen that like I needed to get my shit together. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was I was going out and I I kind of had a turn of like I. I Look, I wasn't going to be able to change it. Like, I wasn't going to be able – I realized I wasn't going to be able to out-drink it. Mm-hmm. And um, how do I turn it into something positive, right? And I, I just – I had this dream to be able to – somebody asked me one time, they're like, what What do you want to do? And I'm like, I just, honestly, I just want to change the world. And I know it sounds crazy, right? It sounds so crazy. But when I when I looked real deep into why have I done, like, the stuff I did in Afghanistan, you know – like, I didn't do it for me. I didn't do it. Everything I did was ultimately down of trying to make the world that I was part of just a little bit better. Like, like anytime I handed out soccer balls to the kids or I went out in front of the gate, you know, I was just trying to make their day a little bit better. Show them a different perspective. When I was when I was taking a shot and I was trying to take a guy out, or I was going in and, and they were asking for help, and hey, we need security in this in this village to help us out. The Taliban's doing this or that. I literally just wanted to make the world just a little bit better. And if if that's truly my core purpose, why well, I can do that here? Mm-hmm. It's no different. One of the things that I've been talking about in a bunch of different ways lately is this idea of being caught in like an echo chamber in a feedback loop and and you hear it in the social media world because if you're a super liberal person, you just see a bunch of super liberal stuff. If you're a super conservative person, you just see a bunch of conservative stuff. It happens in a leadership position because if you're in a leadership position and you have an idea and everyone just is a yes man then says, yep, yep, yeah, you're great boss. That sounds like a great idea and you go forward. You're only hearing, you don't get any other input. Yeah. And it happens to people's mentalities too, where you know they have a bad day and then they think, well, today was so bad and tonight's gonna be bad too and then tomorrow's gonna be bad and I don't, they, they get caught in this echo chamber mm-hmm. of, of reinforcing the same thoughts over and over again and that's fine if they're good thoughts, but when it's a negative thought, and just like you know, when you do feedback with a microphone into an amplifier, right? Yeah. It just turns into a freaking squeal and you can't get out of it until you either shut that thing off or you get that microphone away. So, you know, you were, it sounds like you were in that mode, mm-hmm. but then you thought to yourself, you know, that's a pretty, what you just said of like realizing, hey, I can't change it. Why did I do it? What can I do to move forward? Like that's a huge step away from. Well, it's a, it's it's a, it takes a lot of strength to break out of yeah. this negative attitude. And what sucks is, you meet people and they're freaking trapped in there. Mm. And it's it's I don't know I don't know if you can actually manually. I don't know if I can manually go to you and say, "Hey, you're in an echo chamber right now," and get you out of it. Yeah. I think sometimes I, I think it may be that the person has to do that for themselves. Well, I always say like you you can either like sometimes um, sometimes you find yourself in the middle of nowhere in the middle of nowhere and sometimes in the middle of nowhere you find yourself. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, 
I think what's even what's even more dangerous is when you start drinking your own Kool Aid, right? Like like when you're not looking at everybody else mm -hmm. to and and kind of getting a feeling off of it, and then you surround yourself with a bunch of yes people, like like, and then you and then you only get that you start drinking your own Kool Aid. I mean, what happens? Like, yeah, you can live off of in a survival situation drinking your own urine, but what happens if you drink it five times over? It's that you're dead. Mm -hmm. It's all you know, and and I think that's dangerous. Yeah. Well, actually, it's the same. It's the same mechanism. Same mechanism. It's just a different one's one's positive, one's negative. If you go and just yeah. positive, 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 you'll spin out and you'll think you can't be stopped and you think you can do nothing wrong. If it's negative, 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 you don't think you can do anything right. And the reality is, for everybody, we do some right, we do some wrong. We make some mistakes. We we have some wins. We yeah. we have some losses. We move forward. We take a couple steps back. We move forward again. But people that think, oh, every step I take is going to move me forward and everyone's, you know, everyone's following me because I'm awesome yeah. or nothing I can do can move me forward. It's not, that's not the way life is. It's not one or the other. It's both. Mm -hmm. And people get stuck there in one or the other. Um, you know, I think the, the negative one is the one that, <laughs> look, the positive one, it seems like you, you, what happens with the positive one is when you fall off that train, you at least, you fall onto, you have a little distance to fall and you're gonna be okay. You have like enough room to pull your reserve. Yeah. When you're at the bottom. You're, you're already on your you're, reserve. You're on your reserve and you burn in. And that's what I was on, right? Like I just, it was just, everything was negative around me. The alcohol, I mean, it was just, everything was negative, right? I mean, I'm waking up literally talk, only talking about my teammate's death. And um, I mean, it was just, everything was negative. I mean, it was, and I, um, you know, I, I just had to pull myself out of it. I don't, I don't know of one situation that just like, boom, smacked me out of it. Um, I, I will say this, like ultimately the, 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 one of the biggest changing points in my life was when I had my daughter. Um, that was, that was whenever the drinking quit. Mm -hmm. Like that was whenever I took it and I said, um, I said, you know what? It's not about me. Um, I know uh, I'm I'm not the best person in the world, and you know I I. But I'll tell you this: my daughter didn't choose to come in this world. She didn't choose to come in the circumstances that she came in under. Um, and it is my obligation to ultimately give her, and wake up every day and strive to be the father that that young girl deserves. And that's it. It really is that simple. And so that was whenever the drinking just went to a halt. Um, but then there was a whole slew of problems after that, right? Of now I'm not dealing with my anxiety or my issues with drinking. Now they're coming to light. So, you know, now it was kind of having to face the true reality of this, not 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 taking the Band-Aid. I mean, drinking is no different than taking anti pills. I mean, it's yeah, just painkiller. It's just another, it's just another form of it. Right. And, um, so that was a whole other problem, but, but I got to look at that little girl and like, that was, that is, her, you know, sailor and Atlee are by far, um, I need them way more than they could ever need me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and they changed my life for the better, and they still do every day. Because um, ultimately, that's what the man that I am, I, I, I have to be a good man because I want my daughters to find good men, and I want them to know what a good man looks like. And I want, if they start dating shitty guys someday, it's probably because I'm a shitty guy. I want to set the example to them of hopefully what they strive to go to go find and marry someday. And... I have to wake up and be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weird from a um, being in the military. The perspective for me, because I was, you know, a young uh, enlisted guy. I was going to say young, dumb, and yes, I was a young, <laughs> dumb enlisted guy. And the the more I moved up in the ranks, all of a sudden you're like responsible for people. Mm -hmm. And it, there was no overnight like transition for me, you know, cause I was enlisted yeah. and then I became an officer and I was a junior officer, but I, I it wasn't like I, oh, no, I'm an officer now and now I need to, or I, I, you know, I'm in charge of this training event and so I need to, no, it wasn't like an overnight thing, but I realized that 
hey, all these guys are counting on me to do do my job, mm-hmm. to to make good decisions, to give them the support that they need. Like that's all on me, all on me, hundred percent. And so slowly over time, I I started acting more and more like a freaking responsible human instead of like a complete freaking savage yeah. <laughs> when I was a freaking younger teen guy. Yeah. And so I just got, you know, I just, you know, grew. And then obviously, yeah, when I had kids, it's like, oh, hmm. now there's people that also res- res- uh, rely on me 100% yeah. for everything. For everything. And they're looking at me as an example of how they should be acting and what they should be looking for. Yeah. Yeah. It's big. So you, did you stop drinking like I, yeah, I mean, cold I, turkey? I, I did. Um, when Sailor, when Sailor was born, um, I pretty much, I mean, I pretty much cut it out to cold turkey. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I had to, I mean, I was like, I was in a custody battle first off. So out of the gate, I mean, I wasn't even, I mean, I wasn't, yeah, I mean, yeah, I wasn't there when Sailor was born. And, um, I got to meet her like three months later. And, uh, so, you know, with the custody battle, it was, look, I'll take 90% of it. My fault. Me and Bristol didn't get along. Um, she was, she went back to Alaska. What didn't work out. Right. And so I wasn't there for the, the, the birth. Um, and, uh, so finally after three months of fighting and all the stuff that people do, right. Um, and I, look, I'm sure I caused my amount of it. So let me say that up front. Um, I'm definitely not an easy person to live with. Um, you know, I finally got to meet her. And, man, I'll never forget, like, I flew up. I flew up on an airplane. So first off, after I seen, realized that Sailor was born, I went. It was on the it was on the 23rd, or she was born on the 23rd. Um, and so Christmas that year was 20. Christmas Eve was on a Thursday and um, Christmas was on Friday that year. And um, I went up that Saturday as soon as the stores opened back up. And I, I went ahead and bought like all of her stuff to have in my house. I didn't know when I'd get to see her or anything like that, if she'd ever even get to come to Kentucky. But like, I was a dad, so I was gonna be a dad. And um, I had no clue of how to change a diaper or anything. And then I went to this month long, uh, it's, it's like an online nanny school. And I became a certified nanny and infant care specialist. Um, so I was like doing these classes. I was doing these classes, right? Like of um, how to swaddle, like learning about all these things that ch- kids do, right? And um, I mean, I just never wanted to, it wasn't my daughter's fault. So like, I never wanted to not be what she needed if she needed it. And so like, I needed to spend, my my mindset was is I needed to, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad and I need to try to, if I even if I'm not with her, I need to be training to do something to be able to, to, to give her the life that she deserves. And, um, man, three months into it, I got to meet her. And so I, I fly up there and what I would do is I would fly to Alaska every like, other, I'm going to put this training to the test. Yeah, boy. to the test. Like I had all this stuff, like, <laughs> man, like I knew like the, the five S's of like, what well, you know, how, how to get a child to like, you know, to calm down, like all this stuff. I was a master. At, I had this like little baby doll that I used to swaddle practicing, right? <laughs> um, crazy. I know. I know it's nuts. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I fly up there and uh, so I would fly to Alaska every other weekend and I would um, raise her for four days out of a hotel room, a three month old and uh, from Kentucky. And um, so I would go up there and I got her, man. The first time I laid eyes on her, that was it. Like I got on the plane coming home after those four days and I just said, hey, I'm, I'm getting rid of everything in Kentucky. And I, even if I just have to work at McDonald's, I'm going to Alaska and I'm going to raise this kid. Um, I don't want anything else. I don't want another life. I don't want anything else. I don't care if I just, if I just have to live in a cardboard box on the side of the road, I'm going to raise this kid and I am going to, I'm going to be the best dad that I can be. And, um, that's what I started figuring out. Right. I went home and literally started looking at assets of how to, how to close everything down and leave. And, um, yeah, so that was kind of, that's kind of that. And I just go up there. And then after that, you know, like a little ways into it, we stopped fighting and me and Bristol decided to get married and we got married and, you know, had another kid and then it went to shit. 
<laughs> and and Expected. all this stuff, uh, you you were. This is like tabloid tabloid oh, material. Yeah, all like tabloid. This is just tabloid material yeah. too. Yeah. So you. <laughs> yeah, like if you look at the tabloids now, like uh, <laughs> they don't refer to me as a Medal of Honor recipient. They refer to me as Bristol Palin's ex. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys get married, which, you know, you're doing the best you can. You yeah. know, people do what they're going to do. You're trying to figure things out. Yeah, I mean, we tried. Look, I mean, Bristol's not a bad person. You know, she's um, she's the mother of my children. She gave me the most beautiful things in the world. Like, my kids are healthy. They're beautiful. They are They're the best thing that I have. Um, and I owe her for that. I owe her for, for all that, you know. Um, I'm not an easy person to live with. Like, let me tell you, like, I'm, I'm not. Um, so yeah, so we got, we got our beautiful kids. So where did you move once you got, once you guys got married? So I, I, we, we got married and I literally packed up two suitcases and left for Alaska and I never came home. I just moved in with her and, um, I would fly to the States just as I was on going to give speeches across, mm -hmm. you know, Canada lived up there for a year and then we moved to um, Austin and how you doing like at that point are you starting to sort of uh, process everything that happened are you starting to be like okay these people are calling me a hero yeah. but I have an opportunity to be able to explain to them my perspective of it were you starting to kind of put this together in a way that was more manageable for you no I mean it's still not right because everybody wants to argue with me you know it's like no no like understand I'm a failure Oh, no, you did everything you could. Like, shut up. You know what I mean? Like, no, it's still that way. And, you know, and it's it's just, n no, it's still not. It's still not back. It, you know, people still, they hold me in this regard that I'm like, that I'm something, like, that, that I'm something that I'm, I'm not, I'm no different than anybody else. You know, I was listening to something you said, You, I was listening to, uh, your podcast actually and you were saying something along the lines of hey you know i i received the medal of honor but i don't want to let that define me i don't want that to be like the thing that i'm known for and i started thinking to myself you you and me know how freaking completely random war is like that you don't know what the hell is going to happen there's nothing way to predict anything you could have done that deployment you, you that mission could have got scrubbed for ten thousand reasons that night it could have gone and the Taliban could have not been there. There's like a million things. There's, yeah. And and so really there's a roll of the dice that you were in this situation, the way it went down, you didn't get killed. You know, like it's just, it's so random that if you did hang your hat on that one thing, hmm. it's like, that's like saying, hey, that's like, that's like I won the lotto. Yeah. So you should. You know that means I'm smart or whatever. Like you know, it's it, it, you or can't you should really let me pick your numbers for all your <laughs> lottery tickets. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, was, I was thinking about that. Like you can't let it define you because if you do let it define you, then you're 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 defining yourself on the fact. It's like it's like defining yourself on you know how tall you are. Yeah. It's like hey, you know that's just how tall you are. There's nothing you can do about that. Now look, obviously you took actions that that were conscious decisions to go doing what you had to do, but. You're right in the fact that if you let that one thing define you, you're hanging your hat on on something that's kind of random. Well, exactly right. But it's also, I mean, it's also like, um, like what if, what if like a, a fighter gets in the ring and he he gets a win? I mean, whether like he got a knockout and it was one hit and it was a, is, I mean, are those hits lucky? Right? I mean, you, you know what I mean? Like, like. Could you can you really walk into a ring and say you're gonna like and and, and knock people? You know what I mean? Like some of that is the same, right? right. Some of it is this guy he, he just he if, well, if he didn't break this or you know what I mean? Like it, that's why the games are played, mm -hmm. right? That's why football teams are not <laughs> fantasy. You know what I mean? Like that's why the game is played, and um, so like for me it was like I, yeah that day. That, that day, I like if it comes down to fighting, like I fought my ass off. There's, I'll say that. Um, I fought as hard as I could, uh, but that was one day in my life. What about the rest of them? 
you know, like that day's done, that's behind me. Well, what's next? Right? Like, I mean, I was in a gunfight four days later that, that I felt like was worse than that one. You know what I mean? To, to, obviously, I lost my teammates, which sucked. But as far as like, it, I mean, the, uh, the next one was, was, was a harder one for me to pick out than, than the first one, right? And, and nobody knows about that. I mean, I still kept fighting. We, we've gotten a ton of fights after that. And, and so like, you just can't be defined by that. You know, you're only as good as, as your next at bat. And it's like, you can't, you can't let your failures define you. And you can't let your successes define you. Both of them are nothing more than moments in time. Yeah, that that's that was kind of my um, I don't want to call it a setup, but like it's yeah. one thing. It's one right? thing. And e- even though you feel like, oh, I failed that night, it's like, yeah, that's that was one that was one thing. I did. And yeah. so to say you don't want to define yourself by receiving this one award, it's also you can't define yourself by. Oh, by the fact that that day you didn't win. Exactly, but it still doesn't change Mm -hmm. the results of the day, right? Like, and at the end of the day, those have all taught me valuable lessons. You know, there, you can't, like, and and, uh, hear me out on this, but like life is nothing more than like a, and you're gonna laugh when I define it when I say this. Life is nothing more I'm than, forward than to like, this. <laughs> you know, like you know, like at Halloween, they have those. We're off to a good start. Sc- okay. Scary houses, right? Or uh-huh. those 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 whatever those houses that they're haunted like, houses, haunted houses, yes. right? You can call them scary houses. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. So, <laughs> life is like that's life. After you've walked through that haunted house once, mm. does it get you again? No. So that's life, right? Like. Life is full of these things that are not real that scare us because we've never seen them or we've never seen them in that place or whatever, right? We wasn't expecting it coming there. So it kind of shakes us for a second. But you got one or two options. After you've seen it, you can either, okay, I got it. You're there. You got me on that one. But if I walk through this house again, you don't have me, right? And that in that life, mm-hmm. like that's yeah. life, right? And, um, you know, so like that day I got, the cool part is, is like, that's my, that day is my kryptonite. Um, I'm not going to say that I could never see anything worse because I, 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 you know, obviously it could always be worse, but man, at, at 21, 21, I got to walk through one of the scariest damn houses that life could throw at me. I'm going to tell you right now. I got I got to sit here and look death right in the eyes. I never thought I, I I never thought I would make it out. I got to look at that so I don't have to worry about it. Every day's a bonus day for me. I didn't think I was gonna live past September eight, two thousand nine. I got to sit here and see the very best of human beings. I got to see the very worst. I got to see what I would do if somebody had a gun to my head. I got all these things out of the way in one day that most people go through their whole life wondering what they would do. You know, I got that out at 21. What do I have to worry about? Going into the next house. You know what I mean? I got my ass beat, all of it. You're not gonna beat my ass worse than that. So I don't have to worry about it. You know, the the most dangerous guy in the room is the guy that doesn't care to lose. And I can tell you, I don't care to lose, you know, and that's, that's my kryptonite. That's like my power or whatever, right? Like that's my, and I'm so fortunate to have gotten that out of the way at 21 years old because it's allowed me to go live the life that I've lived, right? I, I get to, man, I jump out of airplanes. I fly airplanes. I fly helicopters. I I, I do it. And it's like, I get to do it because, and I get to go talk to people about what it's like. I get to go tell people it's, it's all good. You can do this. Right. And so it's kind of a, it's good. It's a good thing. So where does like, um, I know, uh, a while ago, you know, you had like anxiety. Yeah. What even is that? What does that feel like? What happens? Where does it come from? What do you know about it? So I didn't even know 
I didn't even know what I didn't even know I had anxiety. Um, I guess like you just kind of get used to feeling this way. And um, I it got so bad like after I moved to Alaska when the drinking stopped that like I would I would wake up throwing up. I would grind my teeth so hard like all, all, my teeth on the back are caps and like I would I have veneers and I would knock my teeth off with veneer like I'd knock them off by grinding my teeth um I mean I'd wake up and I'd be throwing up I would be sweating in bed crying my eyes out like just can't sit down can't like I would try to run it off I can't run it off can't lay down like it just it, it was like I'm like what's wrong with me you know what I mean what is wrong I don't even know what's going on and uh and then I find out that this is this an anxiety attack. And, um, you know, I just, I started dealing with it. I had a real bad anxiety attack, but I didn't want to go, to, like, I didn't want to go to the hospital because, like, the VA gave me the option of, <laughs> the VA gave me an option of, um, I call them up, okay? I call them up and I'm like, hey, I need to, like, I just need to see somebody. And they're like, what, do you have a case manager? I said, I don't like, I, I live in Alaska. I don't. And they're like, okay, now I'm a medal of honor recipient. Um, I mean, I've got pretty high status in the VA. Uh, like as far as the statuses they have, right? Like they have these little levels or whatever. I imagine you so, gotta be pretty high up there. Yeah. So like I ask them, um, I'm like, I just need to see somebody like maybe to give me like some blood pressure medicine or something to help me get this, just get through this. I just need to get something to get through it. I don't want any like, I'm not asking for Xanaxes or whatever, right? And they go, uh, well, if you don't have a case manager, then we'll have to get you one of those. And then after you get in scene with the case manager, then what we'll do is that case manager will get you a doctor. And then after you meet with a, a, a doctor, then they'll get you to a psychiatrist. And then you'll be able to get some help for it. I said, well, how long is that going to be? Uh, probably four to six weeks. And I said, um, I don't have four to six weeks. And... She, the, the woman on the phone, she said, well, you can always come check your in, yourself into the psych ward. And I was like, I don't need that. There's no way. These are my options. <laughs> and um, so I called, I called one of my buddies and he knew a doctor and you know, the doctor was like, they gave me like some blood pressure medicine that, that usually some people take for anxiety. Started taking it and then Fortunately, they sent me this thing called the Alpha Stem, and um, it clips on your ears. And uh, I, when they sent it to me, I wouldn't even open it. I got, I was so mad that somebody sent this to me because I was like, "You really think? You really? This is what you think my level of anxiety is? You think it's a joke?" <laughs> I'm picturing the thing that um, uh, the time travel machine that Kip puts on his yeah. head in, <laughs> in yeah. Napoleon Dynamite, something like that. <laughs> so finally, one day. I'm sitting there and I've got anxiety and um, and it's like it feels like your chest is just like so, like something sitting on your chest. Does it come from like thoughts? No, I don't know. Like, honestly, is it a physical thing? Is it a mental thing? It's physical. It's a fi like it's all physical. Like you'll feel like you're having a heart attack. Um, and you d you could be watching the freaking cartoons with your kids. I mean, I could be just sitting in my truck. Sitting in your truck, playing, nothing, nothing just playing. And all of a sudden, you feel this. Yeah, you can. I can. I can feel it coming. Is it the same as a panic attack? Same thing. But do you feel like you're like worried about something consciously, or it's, it, I think it lives in your subconscious. Yeah. You know, like you can't. No, I mean, I would be. I mean, I would be fine, and then like it just all of a sudden hits, and it's like, it's like oh gosh, like you can feel it coming, and you just how do I get rid of this? And it's I think it's a subconscious piece, right? Like. Um, that's why like it comes out mostly when I'm sleeping because I can't consciously control what I'm thinking about. And when I go to sleep, whatever in your brain needs to come out is coming out. Are you dreaming? Are you having nightmares? Yeah. And the nightmares like trigger this and usually <sighs> when the cure for it, cause you said the case advisor would send you to a doctor the doctor mm -hmm. would send you to a psychiatrist yeah so ultimately is that what they're looking to do to you is give you some kind of medicine. psychiatric medicine mm -hmm. you know xanax is um and these are things that like mellow you out 
Yeah. Or something. They'll allegedly. Zom- they'll zombie you. And get you a, get you addicted to them. Yeah. They'll zombie you. Because they're going to numb the pain. Mm-hmm. They're going to numb the thoughts yeah. that are that are causing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and it, so, it's just, a, it's like a, you get on that. It's a slope, right? It's a slope of, of, you know, well, after you start taking that, then, you know, you start getting depressed, right? Because, I mean, imagine, you know, and that was always my problem. Like, if I took if I took Klodipin or anything like that, well, I, you have a hangover the next day, and then I didn't feel like working out, so then I don't feel like working out. So then it's like you just, it's like a dep- like it just it's like this slope of just, right. then, you know, when you, when you get depressed and you start, you know, you can't work out or you don't feel your normal self, then you're like, well, I'm broken. And it's just like this downward slope of just... It's like, hey, you know what? Like, I don't, I'm not scared to look at it. I'm not scared to look my demons in the eyes. Um, But like when it turns into something like mentally, I can deal with it. It's when it starts coming out physically Mm. is it starts, is it starts getting you right. So, so back to the earlobe freaking machine. So, So (laughs) so, so the alpha stem, um, I finally put it on and it would like melt it away. It would like melt it away. Um, so you start feeling it, go yeah, hook it up. I'd, I'd hook it up 20 minutes at night before I went to bed. I'd sleep better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was awesome. And then um, and then I met this I met this person. Um, she worked with the guys out at Fort Bragg. Um, I met her one and she's like, hey, you need to try this it's called a Stella ganglion block. Um, actually a seal, Sean Mulvaney, Mm -hmm. Dr. Mulvaney. Um, I'm like, come on. Everybody's promised me the world with this stuff. She's like, go do it. S G B S G B. And, um, so I fly out. I I was, I was at, I was at rock bottom again. Like just, it was just, you're just, just frustrating that I can't operate. How how often are you having these anxiety attacks? Uh, Twice a week. And they're freaking crippling. I'm talking about throwing up in the floor. Like I'm talking about. How long they last for? Uh, um, an hour, 45 minutes. And you have an no hour. idea when they're going to hit. No. And there's no going back to sleep after them. Right. Like there's no. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget my daughter. My daughter looked at me one time. We were actually on the road, me and her traveling. And um, so like I would be scared. Like I never liked the kids to sleep in the bed with me because I never wanted my daughters to see me like that. And, um, and there were, there were a lot of nights that I would sleep in my car in the Best Buy parking lot, um, probably about three years ago, four years ago, three years ago, I would sleep in the Best Buy parking lot because I didn't want anybody to see me, see me like that. If I felt like I was getting anxiety and, um, and you, are you still married at this time? Yeah. And, um, is there any, like, how's that going? Is yeah, it just I mean, like you guys are just trying to figure it out? Yeah, and it, just, it is what it is. You know, she can't. I mean, she doesn't. You know, she's look. We got three kids, and and you know, she, you know, she's watching. I mean, how, how could you be married to somebody like that? How could you be married to somebody who, you know, you look at and and like you don't understand their anxiety? So like, you're kind of like, what's wrong with this person? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, this guy's just this weak. You know what I mean? It's like it's not a. It's not some. It's hard to understand. Mm-hmm. You know, and. um and I'll never forget, like me and Sailor were traveling. We were actually at a Marine base, and uh, I'd been speaking to a bunch of Marines, and she was with me, and she was having to sleep in the bed with me at, you know, on on the road. And um, I woke uh, that night. I woke up and I was I was throwing up, and I was sitting on the side of the bed crying, and like my I knocked two of my teeth off, my and they came off, and like she, um, I honestly forgot she was in the bed, and. Um, Man, she got up and like she like she like patted me on the back and she said, "Uh, uh, it's okay, Daddy. Like I know you're a good daddy." And uh, man, it was that was that was a tough one, right? You know, like it was just. Uh, and so I uh, then I was like, I, I got to do something different, you know. Like I was getting the Stella Ganglion blocks. Quite a bit. So you, we, I cut you off or whatever. But so, how was that first one that you went and got? The needle went in. So I was laying on this hot this bed. So the, the process is that they stick a needle into some part of your yeah. neck brain. What? No, so your neck. So like they do it under ultrasound, 
and like they stick this needle on in and it like um, it's a block um, and and it goes on your it goes on one of your nerves and um, it's like a reset and man as soon as before the needle was even out I remember I was looking at I was like literally looking at the ceiling and I didn't want anybody to talk because I got I couldn't believe that that, that I could feel this way like there was like the, the world the weight of the world was off my shoulders. Like the anxiety was gone. Like it was, like I didn't know you could feel like that. And I was just, the next morning, like I was taking a shower and I was, I caught myself like laughing and singing in the shower. And I was like, this is like amazing. And um, so I did that and that worked for a while. What's it blocking? So I guess what it does is, is you have, you have, um, this is how it was explained to me was, is you have your, automated um basically like where you automatically do things like breathing things you don't have to think about blinking and then you have your um where you have to like your manual side of your your nervous system right like we're okay i want to pick this cup up i have to think about that and do it so fight or flight is supposed to be i recognize you as a threat you're a threat now so i recognize that now i go into fight or flight mm-hmm. And what happens is, is when we've been in in that mode for so long, your mind just starts to adapt and it puts it over into the automated side. Ooh. And so that's where you get these guys who are automatically back in that fight or flight. Um, they automatically go back there because their brain has, has shoved it in that system. Got so it. so you're kind of like a, imagine with your, your cell phone, if it's running wrong or an app's running wrong, what do you do? You reboot shut it. Shut her down, yeah. Well, that's what this block does is it doesn't really shut it down, but it kind of helps you reboot your Got system. It. And that's Dr. Mulvaney was one of the first guys to ever give this for PTSD. And what he did was is he went, he was, I guess he was at this clinic and he was seeing all these symptoms that uh, pregnant women were having. Um, when they were when they were going through pregnancies and they were giving this, I guess, it, for some piece of it. And he's like, well, this is kind of, these symptoms are, are kind of, l- let me try it for this. And like, it's been huge. I've saved so, I mean, it's saving lives. Like a lot of the, a lot of the guys get it, you know, and um, it helped me for a long time. Yeah, I got, I got I got some people that have been reaching out to me to talk about it and maybe have some of the experts on here to kind of explain it so more people can understand it. And, yeah. uh, and actually, when they approached me, I said, well, I got a friend that had it. And I actually asked you. And I said, hey, did you get that thing? You said, yep. And I said, how was it? You said, it's freaking awesome. Awesome. So that, that kind of opened my mind up and said, all right, you know, if I, if I just can help spread the word on this, then let's do it. Yeah, and you know, like all these things are, like, let me say this, like like the, the alpha stem, it, it was it was great worked great right uh, the stellar ganglion block like all these things they work um, it's just a matter of how long they work right like the alpha stem I'd have to use it pretty much every day right the stellar ganglion block I mean sometimes I would go six months without getting one sometimes I'd have to go three months you know it just it's about the longevity of how long they worked you know and and honestly none of it's gonna fix it you have to fix it yourself. Like these are all, I call them, uh, they're kind of like flashbangs. Um, they're the, they're the flashbangs of life. It's going to, it's the, you're going to throw that flashbang in there and it's going to give you some time to get on the offense in where they're on the defense. Mm -hmm. Right. So you better make, you better fix it of whatever's causing it. You better get in there and start doing work as soon as, as soon as it, as soon as you get it right it's not a you're not going to sit here and take it and and there you know you not have to go home and work on your life and work on the way you think about things you know you got work to do when you so when you, yeah so what's that work look like because when you i know what i do when i throw a flash flashbang in the room i know what to do next i know what that yeah. work is what's the work when that you're talking about uh i mean look some people want to go do some counseling right? Go into talking to people. Uh, What I say when people go to counseling, I say, uh, I tell people, if you don't have goals, don't go to counseling. Like don't go into counseling and and think that it's going to be somebody else fixing it for you. Um, It's kind of like calling up a trainer and thinking that you, you know, you can go to the best gym, you can have the best trainer and the best nutritionist, but you still got to put in the work. You still got to eat the right food and you still got to show up and do it. Right. And and it's kind of the same thing with counselors. 
um, know what you want changed. You know, no, really look at a take a hard look in the mirror and and it starts with accountability. And like a lot of people want to avoid accountability because as soon as you recognize, as soon as you say and look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm fat. Well, then you've made a conscious choice not to do something about it. And um, so for me, like I know that I have to get like usually I, I look in the mirror and I start seeing who I'm surrounded by. Like when I start going down that road, the first thing I look at where am I spending my time? Um, and that usually tells me the most of it, right? So I'll back off of that. And then um, and then I just start, I start, you know, if I need to go to counseling, if I want to talk to people, I'll talk to people. But most time for me, like, I want to talk to, I'll call you or I'll call, I call people and they don't even know why I'm calling them. But I'll call them. <laughs> I'll call them <laughs> when, just to get it out. Whenever your freaking name pops up on my phone, I'm like, here we go. So, I'm like, do I have an hour? <laughs> yes, so, I do. We're so, ready to rock and roll. I don't know where so, we're going, so, but I know it's going to be good. So, sometimes I get off the phone with you. I was sitting on my front porch talking to you one day. <laughs> I got off the phone. I, I called you for like five minutes, and we were on the phone for an hour. And I got off the phone, and I'm like, I promise you, I walked back, and I'm like, I don't even know why this guy answers the phone for me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time we were talking, and when I got off, my wife was like, who was that? And I was like, it was Dakota. She goes, I have never heard you laugh so freaking hard for so long. I, I One time, I remember I was in my kitchen, and I, I had tears. Literally tears were coming out of my eyes. I was laughing so freaking hard at what you were telling me. And uh, man, and that's happened a few times. It's yeah. happened a few times. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah, I, I I I know when I see that when I see Dakota pop up on my phone, I'm like, all right, yeah. I should freaking record those things, <laughs> yeah. and I could record them for counseling. Oh. I could record them for podcasts, or I could re record them for comic freaking relief. <laughs> yeah, you know, because like you. <laughs> You, you don't help it though. Like, let me say this. You, you are like the fuel of it because, because I'll say something and you'll say like a few little words, just like, you know, like I'll, I'll be coming down and he'll just like say something else, engage. And it's like, here we go again. You know? No, I remember one time you called me too. And you were like, man, you were ready to go hot. Oh, I was. And I was like, all right, man. And actually I remember what I said. I said, okay, let's think about this strategically. Let's think about this strategically. What if you execute what you're talking about executing? <laughs> I said, I said, where are you going to be in six months? Where are you going to be in three years? Where are you going to be in five years? <laughs> like that was pretty much all I had to you, say. Did you? Had to you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh uh, yeah. I, I remember. I remember that conversation. Yeah, uh, Jocko, jo all Jocko told me was, and he didn't say not to do it. Understand this? He didn't say not to do it. He. Uh, he said, hey, he said, if you're going to do it, um, like only do it if it's worth losing everything. That's exactly what he told me. Mm. And uh, <laughs> That's a big statement. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what I left with. And I was walking around Lowe's, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> he's working around so my what is it? Like, what, store. So what were you going to do? We're, we're, not, we're not talking we're about not that. Lowe's. Lowe's. Uh, we're not talking uh, about that, but we will uh, say it was not legal. <laughs> In, in no way. It was okay. in no way legal. But I had already like, thought it. He had a freaking course of action brief for me. He was calling me like I was the freaking <laughs> battlefield commander. He's like, hey, boss, I got a course of action. I want to run by you, see if I can get mission to execute on this thing. I'm like, okay, go ahead. You know, I'm all ears, bro. What you got? At Seven Lowe's. minutes okay. later, you know, he's running through timelines, <laughs> oh, the I, execution checklist. Oh, man, I'm man. like, okay. I already had the cover up where, story ready to go, you? you know? Yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. The, man. <sighs> <sighs> but like that to me is like, like that, like, but you know what? Like, but I know who to call, right? Like I know in that situation, I'm not going to call some idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because next thing you know, they're like, where are you going to meet you at? Let's do it, right? <laughs> like I, I know, I know, like I'm so fortunate. I got, I've got all, like I've got quite a few just people that I just look up to so much. And I trust, I trust like, like you, like if you tell me something, like, I, I, I know, I know it's what you would do. And so I trust that, right? Like, I know it's exactly what you believe in what you would do. And so, like, that's why, that's why I would call you with something like that. Or I would call you, and that's, for me, that's, 
that's my that's how I fix myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's it's uh, believe it or not, if you have people around you that can are are on the same wavelength as you. It's a method of actually detaching from the situation because you're all wrapped up in it, right? You're with the emotions and all this stuff. You're all wrapped up in it. I'm not just saying you, but any human. Echo could be all wrapped up in some emotional thing and call me up and be like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I want to do. Because we're bros, I... I'm thinking in your best interest. I'm thinking in your best interest. So I'm, th- but I'm not wrapped up in it. Yeah. So I can say, "Hey, man, l- let's think through what you want to do right now. Let's see what the long, t- <laughs> let's I see mean, what the long I term." Mean, in that, why, like in fights, I mean, their coaches are in the coaches corner. Coaches are there. Right? The coach is in the corner, right? Like, the the coach isn't out there necessarily, you know, engaging or necessarily having to put in the physical piece of it. But the coach is making sure that the guy doesn't get too emotional, making sure to, to stay stick to the plan. Exactly. And and that's why it's so important in life. You know, like even back when all this media stuff used to go on and I would get hammered. Like I have a few people who are very the one of some of the best in the media world. And um, I'll back up and call them. And you know what? I make a rule. I make a rule that as soon as I pick up the phone, like I'm not calling you for advice. Like when I call you about that, like if you say don't do not do this or, or hey, do this, well, I listen to that. Because I picked up the phone and I called and asked it. Like I'm not going to sit here and ask you and then go do something stupid mm-hmm. because like why mm-hmm. would I even waste your time? You know, and, and that's I think that's so important to have those people in your life. Um to be that logic side when you get into the emotional side too much, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, for sure. All right. So we're getting the, the stellet ganglion block and that's sort of giving you the opportunity to, 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 to work some of these things out. You know, the weird thing is I was thinking about, so one of the things that I, I know for a fact, right? So, you know, um, for me, I'll, I, I'll go and talk to a company or I'll go and talk to people or I'll talk on this podcast about the worst days of my life, right? When I lost guys. And it's, I believe it's helpful because I've like, okay, I've talked about, I've written this down. I've explained what the situation is. Even, even, you know, um, giving like eulogies for my friends at their, at, at their, uh, Memorial services like you have to kind of think through things and you have to process them and then you write down and then you Like even that for me, it's sucks and it's freaking horrible. But at the same time, I know that it it allows me to sort of Gather together my thoughts and put them in some kind of perspective and when you write something down You're actually detaching from it. You're actually detaching from it. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, You're it's on the paper It's 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 actually on the paper and then when you talk to some people about it it's like, oh, you get to see their perspective. They get to give you some of their perspective about it. And so it's a way of, um, uh, I, I guess, just working through the problem. Like it's like almost like stretching your, when you're sore, you know, you, you stretch out, yeah. right? It's almost like that. Hey, I'm going to get some blood back in there. I'm going to think through this. And the difference for you, like in those early days, is people are just putting their perspective on you. It was yeah. like just layering it on you all the time. Yeah, and like, let me ask you this. So like, when you, like, what? how old, like, where, where were you at in your life, like, when you lost your guys? 35. Okay, were you married? Yes. Okay, so like, so like. Check. So like. How the, old are you right now? I'm 32. Yeah. So, so my, my, my thing is, is right, is like. What what would have happened if you know you 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 had that had happened ten years before? For sure. You know you know what I mean. So like I think that's what's I think that's where you like that that's 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 what's awesome about is like you're kind of like for just for me I'll talk about for me like you're the um, you're you're the I, well, I can like you're the you're the better side of this. Like I can like you you give hope to a guy like me. That man, I'm I I can get there. I can I can I can be okay. Like this ain't this ain't like the realities that are in my mind sometimes. Like I understand. Like I can look at somebody and say, look, no, no, this isn't realities. Like I'm not. I, I will figure this out. 
If I if, if I if I hang around people, if I hang around Jocko and I, I take that and I take that mentorship, I can be that someday. I can get there someday. I can literally look at it. It's not an idea, your reality. And for a guy like me, that's reality. And I think that's but but on the backside of it, you're not giving me you're not giving me advice. The guys, if I talk to my buddies, like I'm taking advice from a guy who's seen it at, at, at 23, mm-hmm. 21, my, their selves, right? You got to see it from a perspective at an older age with a different life. 100%. My, my whole, in fact, I, my whole experience of like being in combat was the most the most gentle like rock like the first operations i did were like not there was like nothing like cool we're going outside the wild it was like this really nice kind of ramp slow ramp it wasn't just like oh welcome to combat <laughs> you know everything's freaking crazy yeah. so i you know even even like the the just the nervousness about of being like oh this is real like that was i i was very lucky yeah I got that out of my system the first five ops I went on and nothing happened, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I kind of got this, right? And then it was just a slow kind of ramp from there. And and yes, I was old. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe I was three years older than you are right freaking now. I mean, that's pretty but, crazy. And I'd spent my whole life in the military. Mm-hmm. And that's what, uh, you know, so the, yeah, I was a huge, it, I was very, very lucky in the way things unfolded for and, me. And, and when things, if they got, it, when they got not good for you, you had a person in your life that you trusted with everything. That you knew if you were starting to get off the path, you knew you could look at her and you could have a good gauge. You had a you had a very good gauge of the man that, that you were. Yeah, and I think more than that, um, in my own mind, I realized that I needed to. And I, I'll tell you what, I talked about this with JP when JP was on here. And um, and it, it, so when when Mikey got killed, we were sending him home. And he was, so we're going into like a Connex box to like say goodbye to him one at a time. And like I walk, so basically you can walk into the Connex box. You see Mikey, you know, freaking give him a kiss and, and, and say goodbye and then turn around and, and walk back out. And um, I remember just looking at, at JP, and because JP was like right ahead of me walking in, and as he's walking back out, like I, I see JP, and JP was 22 or 23 years old, yeah. and this was his bro, and I look at his face, and he is just fucking, just absolute torment in his face. And I said to myself, like, hey, Jocko, you better keep your shit together right now because, like you said earlier, like, it's like a breaking point. And people, if one person breaks, and I'm the guy that's allegedly in charge, and if I break down right now, man, it's going to be, it's going to be a nightmare. And I I remember seeing him, he turned around, he looked at me in the eyes, and his face was just tormented, and, and JP's such a passionate guy, and he's so emotional, and, and, and he was young, you know? And I just remember I, I said, I, I better, you gotta keep your shit together right now. Because they, cause, you know, they, they, J, need they, they need you, right? They need you to act like a fucking man right now. And th- that's what I had to do. And I kind of felt like, you know, with, with my wife, with my family, it's the same type of thing. Like, hey, you gotta hold the line. Like, you gotta, you gotta do this. And, and look, my, my wife's a freaking badass, you know? She's the one that was, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to Mikey's funeral. I was still in Iraq. I didn't go to Mark's funeral. I, I was still in Iraq. Like this is, this is, this is my wife going to those things, you know. So, and she's by the way, she's got three kids. Yeah. You know, she's getting a babysitter so she can go to my friends' funerals. So I'm not trying to sit here and say like, oh, I had to be all all strong. She had to be strong. Mm-hmm. But that's what um, I, I guess to your point, I was older. I had a little bit more life experience, um, and you know, as you get older, you're you're more able to handle things and put them in perspective. Yeah, I mean, at, at, so like at 33, that would be 12 years older than what I was when it happened to me. You know, and and I'm by no means I'm not I'm not saying that it's either way or the other. I'm just saying that like 
the world's a little bit different then, right? And, 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 you know, like the maturity levels of how I handled a lot of it is not the right way. You know what I mean? Like was drinking and, and going out and, and, you know, punching people in the face, like, you know, and, and in the new book we, we have coming out, right? Like I talk about like, you know, just, I mean, man, I was evil. Like, I don't want to tell you, like I came back and I mean, I was mean. I was mean. And the problem was, is like when you take mean and you take a guy who doesn't care and a guy who felt like he's already lost everything, like that is a dangerous dude. Like I would, it was nasty. I would say stuff like I hurt my family. I mean, I would say do stuff and it's just, you know, and, and I'm not saying like, I just didn't handle it right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have anybody there to, to hold the line with me, you know, like. I mean, everybody, I, I mean, my whole team was gone. Like everybody, like my, the, the leaders on my team were gone. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, do I regret, I regret a ton of it. And maybe if I had dealt with it better and maybe I had, you know, you just never know. Right. And, um, but yeah, it's just, it's different. It's different. You know, this brings me back to something you were talking about earlier and I just want to, so you're talking earlier about like having a mentor and having people and I, I just want to say like You know if you're in a position where you can help somebody out that maybe you've already been through the haunted house And you can give them a heads up and, and I think people when they hear uh, being a mentor This isn't like this has to be some official thing like hello, Dakota are you, <laughs> would, you, would you like me to mentor you? This is not what I'm talking about but just being being someone that can indirectly Say, hey man, how's it going? Mm-hmm. Like, hey, wh- what are you doing with that? Hey, what do you what do you think is going to happen next? Just yeah. those kind of comments. To be a mentor, you don't have to sign up, and you don't have to you don't have to freaking go through a course. You know, there's no eight week. What would you what would your baby care course go? There's no oh, yeah, course. For, <laughs> there's no course for how to handle a 22 year old or whatever. It doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. But just giving sharing your experience. And the the other thing is you don't have to be perfect. I'm damn far from per- I'm not even cl- I'm not even the same ballpark, right? You don't have to be perfect to be able to say, "Hey, listen, Dakota, when this happened to me, here's what I did. Here's the actual mistakes that I made." Yeah. Right? The, 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 here's the things that I freaking completely screwed up. Watch out for these things. So it's not, "Hey, Dakota, here's what I'm doing and I was perfect." No, f- not even close. So maybe you might be thinking, listen to this like, well, oh, uh, uh, you know, I'm not good enough to be someone's mentor, bullshit. Or maybe you think I don't wanna be someone's mentor, bullshit. Be someone's friend, build a relationship with them and show them the freaking path through the haunted house. Tell them what they can expect. Even if you screwed it up, it's better than, it's better than, uh, than letting them just, you know, get, get in a bad situation. But don't try to mentor them on something you have not gone through. Don't and say it up front. That's got to be your disclosure. Yeah. Of, you know, and, and like, I'm so fortunate because like, I mean, I'm, I'm surrounded by people I don't deserve. Like I've got, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm just so fortunate to have just great people. I can pick up the phone and call it. Hey, hey, what do you think about this? Right. And, and, you know, I'll tell you the one thing that I cut out when, whenever I start going, you know, when I tell you I have to do that self-reflection and look around, the people who are feeding into my bullshit are the people that have to go. Like the people who hype me up on my bullshit. Like when I call up and I'm like, hey, yeah, what do you think about this? Oh, you know, like, no, oh, that's bullshit or whatever, right? Like that's the first people that have to go. Um, I don't I don't need a cheerleading squad. You know, I, I need people who are going to look at me like Tim Kennedy. Like Tim Kennedy looking at me and saying like, you know, I, I'll never forget one of the, we, we were working out one time and, um, I said something, he could tell I was down, I was, you know, I was going through my divorce and stuff. And I, I looked at him and I said, man, I made like an offhanded comment, I'm like, gosh, I'm, I'm fat. And he like, Tim stopped what he was doing and he looked at me and he said, hey, check it out. He said, you, when people hear your name, they look at you as a warrior. When you walk on stage, they expect a warrior. When you talk, they expect a warrior. When you wake up in the morning, they expect a warrior. So you know what you need to do? You need to look in the mirror, you need to start acting like one. And that was it. Turn around, went back to work out, right? But that's what I need, right? Like, was that like a kick to me? 100%. But like, I don't need people 
to, to feed in to, to my bullshit. I need people who are going to hold me accountable to standards that I can't even hold myself to, who, to, to, to know what I can be and hold me to that standard. No, hold the line when I don't even see it myself. Yeah, no doubt. And Tim Kennedy is Tim, one of those. Coming at you. <laughs> coming at you live, man. He free, when he calls me, it's always going to, like, he calls me for, like, reasons. He's like, hey, this is what's going on. He's, like, ready to brief me. It's freaking legit. Like, He's like, hey, here's what's going on. I got this, this, and this. I'm like, hey, Roger that. Well, let, let me think about this. Okay, here, here's a move, you know, or whatever. Here's a deal. Like, pfft. like if, if I called Tim Kennedy up and I said, hey, man, um, like, if he thought I was feeling sorry for myself, I was like, hey, man, I think I'm just going to end it today. I, like, I honestly think that Tim would be like, oh, hey, just make sure you leave all your cool. Like, I, hey, can I have your two guns? <laughs> like, he's not going to play the sympathy. Like, if, if I needed something, though, like, the dude would be like, like, hey, I, I killed this guy. All right, well, 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 I'll bring the shovel. You know what I mean? Like, but I know these guys are like that. Yeah. And, and that's where I'm so fortunate because I got that circle, right? Like, that circle is everything. Yeah. And I guess what I'm saying is that's awesome. And everybody that's listening, you can actually be part of that circle for yes, somebody else. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And if you do that, man, you you make such a huge impact in people's lives by doing that. So, how long were, was the Stellet Ganglion block like the deal? Are you still getting that? I, I don't like. I um, I probably did it up until two thousand twenty. Um, and then my buddy, um, I was struggling real bad. Like I was, it just, well, I don't know. I was just still, I was still struggling with it. Right. And, um, he's like, you gotta go, you're going to Mexico. And I was like, for what? <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. You're going to Mexico. I, he said quite a few veterans are going down there. Uh, guys I trusted he named off a few people that I trusted had gone to this and I said all right and so I booked a trip and uh, flew into San Diego and so I was going down to do uh, it's a therapy uh, with Ibogaine and 5-MeO DMT and something that I was the furthest thing that I could you, you could ever get me to be around I was like, this is complete bullshit. And honestly, I was going to go, and I told the doctor when I got there, I said, hey, I'm coming to this just so I can walk away from this and tell people that this is all this is all bullshit. And I told him that. I said, as soon as this doesn't work, I'm going to go on every podcast I can, <laughs> and I'm going to tell everybody that this is all this is all. So what, what were you going for? What was it? It's called Ibogaine. Okay. And uh, it comes from a root. What was the other thing that you said? 5-MeO. It comes from a toad, DMT. So this is when Mike Tyson and, uh, and, and Joe Rogan are talking about r riding the toad, this yeah, is what they're talking about. Toad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you rode the toad. Yeah. Um, so I went down there, and I was in a bad – like, I was still – like, my anxiety just – you know, and, I, and, and for me, like, the only thing that – I like, when I look back at it, Whatever, what, what, what always got me to the point of where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow was anxiety for like th the best way to describe it for you is imagine when you're underwater and you, you, you can't breathe. You should know very well. I do. What will you do to get to the top, to get a breath, mm -hmm. whatever it takes. Yep. Right. And that's what anxiety is. Like if you can't get rid of it, you'll get to the point to where you're like, if I have to end it for anxiety to get rid of this feeling, I will do that. And that was the that was the only thing that got me there. And so I went down there. Um, the other guy I'm talking about, I won't mention his name, but he, he was struggling too. And let me tell you something. He's one of the hardest dudes I know. My team leader, you know, and this was about a year after my team leader, um, who was a Marine sniper, took me through, got me to become a Marine sniper, went to Iraq with him, deployed with him. Then he went over it, got out of the Marine Corps and said, forget it, I'm going to go be a Navy SEAL, became a Navy SEAL, um, deployed with the Navy SEALs, uh, the team out in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one day he just said, I'm done, and put, it, put, it, put his gun to his mouth and killed himself. Uh, my, another hard guy, I know. And so 
you know, when people call these guys cowards, um, they're not cowards. Uh, they're not cowards. These are some of the hardest men that have ever walked the face of the planet. And that's why, you know, I, you have to take it serious. And, uh, so anyways, this guy, he went down there, I get down there and, uh, you have to sign like paperwork that says you may experience that you're dying. I mean, it is one of the scariest things I've ever done. <laughs> and after you take it, there's no, you write it till there's it's no gone. There's no off ramp. There's no off ramp. And um, so I took this, so you go there and it was like, you didn't eat all day on a Friday. I took the Ibogaine at 8 mm -hmm. p.m. on Friday. And now you're talking about, you, they were like, doing this sage stuff, like hippie stuff. And I'm like, you guys are hippies. Like, I don't, I don't need any of that. Like, I, I'm nothing against hippies, but I'm just not one, right? Sure. I don't know. I can't get into this, you know, waving this stuff around or whatever. And um, believe in whatever you want, again. But, like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get in the mood. And um, so I'm like, I take it, and uh, you have to write down your intentions mm -hmm. on this piece of paper. And I just wrote that... Um, I just wanted some relief. I wanted some, I just wanted some relief, like whatever. Mm -hmm. So you go up and you lay down in this room, you lay on this, the bed, this bed's on the floor and, uh, you put these blindfolds over <clears throat> and I didn't feel anything for a minute. Wait, when you take it, what is that? Like a drink? A it, pill? No, it's like, like the pill. It's oh, measured yeah. out. So you take it, gotcha. drink it with water. You know, I, in, you and I talked a little bit before you came out here and, and I, I knew about some of these things that you were trying and I don't know about these things. Yeah. And one of my friends, Tim Ferriss is like, just to, to, to say like, when you're like, Oh, this hippie stuff, that's kind of the way I think too. Right. Yeah. And, and I like want to understand it better because I know it helped you look even, even Rogan, he told me, he's like, I think it will help. I think it will help Dakota. Yeah. And you and I went back and forth. I was like, hey man, I'm gonna ask Joe. And I said, hey Joe, what do you think? And at that point he'd met you and he'd, you'd been yeah. on his podcast. And he was like, uh, and that was actually, you actually texted me. I did. You were like, hey, this is what I'm coming to San Diego for. What do you think? And I was like, dude, I don't freaking know. Let me ask Rogan. <laughs> so I asked him. And of course, what does he say? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but he, but he wasn't, I mean, as much as Rogan is, is understands this stuff and he's for it. He was also like, he laid out reasons. Yeah. I'll text him and ask him a question about something and he'll be like, no, don't no, That is not going to help. If you're trying right. it for this, he's like, nope, that won't help you. So so that's one part of it. Like Rogan has that level of understanding. And then on the other side, uh, Tim Ferriss is tr like trying to get this stuff approved medically and trying to get support there. And so I just asked him to give me a rundown of like, hey, what is all this stuff? What, what, you know, what, what, it's not just hippie stuff. And he's like, no, it's not just hippie stuff. And here's what it is. And, and like he said, I began because he, he, he was kind of talking me through this. I began from some shrub it's in a, yeah. Africa. Mm -hmm. And, and he said it's like the most powerful. It's the most powerful there is. Right. He said a lot of SEALs do it because SEALs are like, you know, all right, what I'm going hard. Yeah. What do you got? <laughs> and so so that's what Ibogaine is. Ibogaine is it's a, a lot of times they use it for opiate addiction. So. Yeah. But like it's so it's so hardcore that they put these people on it for opioid addiction and it kicks their ass to where they don't do opioids again. All right, so back to your story. So you so you take the thing. They're so waving. I, they're waving hippie stuff yeah, around. Like they're waving no offense to hippies, around. but yeah, you no, ain't no, down. No, no, no offense. No, I mean, I just I couldn't. And, and I like they laughed at me the whole time, right? They're like, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I can't get. Are into these this. are these Americans that are down there? Are they? So there was like, uh, yeah, all of them were except for two. Okay. Um, and uh, so we're we're there in this house and. Um, and then there's a bunch of there's a bunch of seals there, as like that are making sure we nothing nobody comes in that are there to help you um, if you need something. But like all I'm gonna tell you, all I'm gonna say is is like I was surrounded by seals, mm -hmm. um, and so that tells me 
like, hey, like seals are no bullshit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and that's, yeah. So I took it and um, all of a sudden, like, it's, I feel it starting to come. Like, it, it's like, it was like the spinning. And, um, and you were just like, it was like all, it's like I was watching my life on a TV screen. And um, I didn't see anything from war. And uh, I was walking through this town and everything looked gloomy. And uh, I, 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 I'll never forget, I went into this one room. And I went in this room and I, I seen like all these people, it was like this huge crowd. And, uh, but I felt like just disappointment. And, um, and I got, I did my typical me of wanting to fix it. Like, well, what did I do wrong? Like, how can I fix this? And I kept running up to all of them. And then it would be like flashing of people that I knew and people that like, I knew I hadn't done anything to, but just did it for manipulation. And like, there were just flashing on and on and finally I'm just like well what did I do wrong and like I just remember feeling this like this feeling of just defeat and I was in there for probably four hours and then I came out and as I was walking down the town like I would look at every little gauge and it would be like uh the gauge would instead like it, it would fill up and instead of being at full it would say finished and it would be like this far from finished and I never finished anything and then I would see this beautiful ball of light and I would go to it and it would be my two daughters playing. And um, this went on until 3 p.m. on Saturday afternoon. And I'll never forget there was at one point of it, I, uh, like I was just, like I just felt like I was such a, just trash that I was finally just like, I just, I don't care anymore. Like my ego, it took my ego and just smashed it. And it's like, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care. I know I wake up and I, I'm the best me and I know I give my best. I'm not perfect. I know that I know that I don't come off and say the right things, but I know what my intent is. I know there's, you couldn't look at me and make me question my intent. Like you can definitely question my delivery. You can criticize how I come off or how I do this or, but my intent is there and my intent is good. And I'll never forget like that. It, it broke everything. It's like got to the point to where like, I didn't care anymore. And like, I'll never forget that I was laying there and I was like, just, I like, if this is how I die, this is how I die. And, um, I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care what my mom thought of me. I didn't care what, you know, all these people that I had, I had invested in and I had gave them these titles, which when you give somebody titles, you give them authority. I didn't care anymore. You're not going to tell me what my intent is. And so I come out of it. I was so pissed off when I came out of it. Like I literally looked at the doctor and I said, this is what you brought me here for. I said, I, I called up the guy who sent me there, who's a close friend. I said, this is 100% bullshit. Like, I was so down. Like, because my biggest fear was opening Pandora's box. And um, he's like, wait till the next day. So the next day, you do this this 5-MeO DMT. And um, I'll never forget, like, I, I, I wanted to make sure I seen the world the same. So I'm looking out this window in Mexico, and we're looking out. We're right by the ocean, and I look out, and all I can see is, is I, all I can think in my head is, man, this place is a shithole. That's all I can think. I go down, I do this DMT, and I, I, I lay down, and as soon as you go, like, it's almost like it, it was like feet first. Like, I was like gone, like to a tube, right? And, um, and it feels real. Yeah. Or do you know that you're like, no, you know you're tripping? You, you don't see anything. No, you, you know. I mean, you know, it's, it's not like it's a physical thing. Like when you drink, you physically feel drunk. Mm. It, it's like your soul. Like it's, it's, not a, it's not a physical reaction. It's like your soul. And um, <clears throat> I was, it, it was gone. And like you can't see anything. It was pure white. It was the most beautiful white that I've ever seen in my life. It was, there's no, there's no word in the English dictionary to ever describe how beautiful the white was. And all I could feel was love. 
Like I felt good. I felt like you could feel what good is. Like if you took how I feel when my daughters give me a hug or that that unconditional love, like that's what the whole place felt like. It was like the perfect temperature. I didn't think about anything else. Um, and all I heard were my teammates say that it was all right. And um, yeah, it, it was like, it was like everything bad was gone. It was like, I got a, like a reset in my life. And uh, when I came back too, I set up and I just like, I started crying. And I looked at these, this, these two women who were there, these two nurses, and I just couldn't believe that like there were such, there were like, I had to like, I'm in Mexico and there's two people who genuinely care about me. And uh, I care about me enough to, to help me through this. And I looked out the window and I was like, gosh, this is the most beautiful place I've ever been. And I didn't have any anxiety after that. I went back home. The stuff that like would send me over the edge. Man, I was just happy to be alive. I was just, I woke up every, like I still, I mean still, still I get up. And do I have bad days? Yeah, but but like, I'm just happy to be here. You know, like, like I, you know, I, I just, it changed my whole life. Like I, I came back and my anxiety was, I mean, I get normal, there is normal anxiety. But like that, those anxiety attacks, I haven't had one since. How long has it been? It'll be two years this November. You know, the, the thing that you said about intent is something that I, I, I talk about a lot from a, from a leadership perspective and that bleeds over into life because I think if you're doing the right things for the right reasons, if your intent is good, you're gonna be okay, right? If you're not trying to screw somebody over, if you're not trying to maneuver, if you're not trying to you know, sneak one by somebody, if you're not trying to look out for your own agenda, like the military, it's a classic example. You get an officer or a senior enlisted leader that what their intent is to get themselves promoted or what their intent is to get themselves a freaking award or credit or accolades, if that's what their intent is, everybody can see it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work out good for them in the end. If their intent is good, that they wanna get the mission done, that they wanna take care of their team, that, they wanna, that they're putting themselves below their team and lifting their team up, like that intent is what, what makes a good leader, what makes a good person. Mm -hmm. And I think when people have bad intent, it eats them apart, it eats them up. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can have bad intent, you can cover it up, you can try and drown it out, you can pretend that it's not there, but it's there. And, and what I tell people is like, intent, you can smell people's intent. Mm -hmm. And the worst part about it is you can smell your own intent. You can. And if you have bad intent, you have to sit in that rotten stink yourself mm -hmm. and it will eat you apart. You can, you can put perfume all over it. You can put deodorant all over it. Mm -hmm. It's still there and you know it. Mm -hmm. So that's like a realization that you had of my intent is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like, look, your intent is, is, is your foundation of your house. Your priorities are basically the, the shell of your house. They can change. Mm -hmm. You can move rooms. Mm -hmm. You can adjust on it, right? Um, but if your intent, you know, if your intent is, is, is wrong, that house is not going to stand. You can't keep building on that house. You can't keep adding on to it. You can't keep making it better. The foundation is done. It's done. And... The only difference between murder and self-defense is intent. 100%. And nobody can question that. No. It, it, it is what it is. It's, it's black and white. It is, it, it is an, your intent is absolute. And that's ultimately, when you start digging down the root of this tree, that's ultimately what's going to decide if you're going to hold up in the bad times or not. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, and I, 
don't know if you I don't know if I caught exactly what you said, but I've seen people in change their intent in their life. Hundred percent. So, okay, so I I, I I thought you said like, oh, you can't change your intent. You can't change your intent of something that happened in the past. Mm-hmm. But if you've been running around looking out for yourself and stepping on people's backs, and that's the way you roll, mm-hmm. you can change that. You can actually begin to act like a good person. Yeah. But but here's what I'll tell you is, is you can't be both. That is you, true. You cannot. You can't. You can't be selfish and selfless. You're either one or the other. And there is no, well, I'm selfish at these times, but I'm selfless at these times. No, no, no. Because then when you're selfless, you're only being selfless when you want to be selfless, and that's selfish. Yep. Right? right that's like it. <laughs> there's no being both in this life. Like you don't get to you don't get to skirt the line. You're either all in on one or the other. And it's obvious. And there's no there's no, there's no any, there's no ex, there's no a- excuse for that. It is what it is, and you know it, and you know it on everything you do. You ultimately know it. Is it like a one-time thing? I just, I've done it once, and then, you know, the only, the only thing I'll do now is like a, like I'll use psilocybin if I, if I start feeling anxiety come around, right? Like, um. I'll I'll just do a dose of psilocybin. Okay, so psilocybin is mushrooms. Mushrooms. Yeah. And and then when you say you feel it coming, is this like, hey, tomorrow, like I feel like I'm nervous about tomorrow, or is it like, hey, I'm starting to feel nervous right now? No, I start like you know, like I came home from that Ibogaine experience and like I got to see the world in a a place that I've never seen it. Like I got to see like with a relief that I had never felt. I didn't know that people could really walk around like this. And, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, you gotta take, I, I grew up in chaos. Um, I mean, I, the only, a lot of times, you know, my, my biggest thing is, is, is not like people talk about being in like the, the dark places. Well, I, I'm comfortable there. The problem I have is is being in the light where there's not dark places. You know, I have the problem of being when there's no chaos. You want to talk about where I'm the best is is you put me in the most chaotic environment and, and it needs to get figured out. Like and the stakes are high. Well, that's that's where I'm good. The problem I'm trying to learn is how to be okay when it's not chaotic. And that's what I have to have, that's what I have to work on. How often do you feel like that anxiety is coming? And you go like like how often do you feel like oh I, I better get a little bit of a little bit of psilocybin to help me get through this? You know, once a quarter. One like so I'm just me personally. Mm-hmm. Like I I don't think like I I don't none of this stuff do I look at as a recreational type of thing. Mm-hmm. Like I don't I don't think I think if if you if you're using it as a medicinal piece as a not as a medicinal of I'm going to do it every night before I go to bed you know what I mean like if you're using it to to because it's something you need nobody questions somebody who takes blood pressure medicine mm-hmm. you know what I mean yep. like so you know for me about once a quarter you know and I'll do like I'll do a big dose like 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 a six or six or seven grams of psilocybin, and then like how I'm good. Mm-hmm. It's like five hours, and then I'm good. So before we wrap up this little section on uh, this is this is I, like I said, I talked to Tim, and and he just gave me a bunch of really good information because. I don't understand this stuff. I don't know about it. I've never done it before. And but I've talked to so many of my friends that have had that it's helped them so much, you included. That I I want, you know, I have an open mind. I want to understand it better. Um you know, a couple of things that he said actually, there's a few things that he said. Number one, like because the veteran community has gone through such traumatic experiences, that's the main group to to 
need this type of treatment. The other one is is survivors or victims of traumatic assaults, whether that's sexual assaults or physical assaults, but people that have been through that. So it's, but but there's no federal funding for it. So there's no federal funding for it, which means there's no, there's, there's not enough money. It's just people that are donating, donating money to try and try and help get funding for more research. Um, the, the thing about specifically he said about mushrooms is they've been used for thousands of years, right? So mushrooms have been used for thousands of years. Um, and, and he also said, and this was interesting to me, like there's no, you don't need, you don't want to do more. Uh, no. He, he said you do some and you're like, okay, I, I don't want to do more. It's not, it's not like heroin or cocaine where when you do cocaine, apparently, because I've never done it, but apparently when you do it, you just want to do more. When you do, I had, a, I had a neighbor that had gotten out of prison and moved in with his uncle, and I, he, was, he was out of prison after seven years, and he, um, he, he was on meth. And he said, the first, he, he said, hey, the first time I did crystal meth, it was the only thing I ever wanted to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. So... And he went right down that path and stole from everybody that he knew and freaking wrecked his life and ended up in jail. Uh, but you know what Tim was saying is like there's there's like an anti addictive like um, because you can't you don't want to do it every day. No, I mean like I couldn't imagine if you thought you were going to go out and party and somebody gave you a thing of ibogaine. <laughs> you, you, I, you know what I mean? Like like like. Like I couldn't imagine if you thought you were gonna go out and party and you took you know six to eight grams of psilocybin. Like for me personally, maybe I'm weak, but I I just I couldn't imagine. And like there's nothing about it. Like it's like work. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm taking this, like I know I'm going in to do some work. The um. The way he was describing it to me, and he's heard me talk about detaching, you know, wrote about leadership strategy and tactics, talking about detachment. He's like, oh, yeah, here's what it is. He goes, uh, mushrooms, psilocybin is like it is your brain can detach and look at what is going on, and then you can find a solution for it. And you just made a face like, yes. It's clarity. Like, I get off, like I come off of it, and I can think clearer than I've ever been able to think. He he said, you know, I began definitely got to be careful. He said there's cardiac risk, like you can have some significant problems from that. Um, whereas mushrooms, he he said basically, I don't think there's any like reported ODs on mushrooms. You would have to do pounds of it, and there's no <laughs> way you can do pounds of mushrooms. <laughs> he also said that he said, look, th- th- there's a whole warning thing, right? There's a whole like warning thing that you need to watch out for. Uh, Specifically, if you've had schizophrenia in your family, it's like a big red flag. It's probably a no go. They don't when when they're testing it, they don't test it on people that that have had those types of uh, problems before. But um, it, it, like you said, like it's like these these things are one to two, maybe three sessions, and you don't need it anymore. Um, so some of the other warnings: look, there's legal. Like there's, le- it's, oh, yes. it's illegal. Yes, it's illegal. It's illegal. Mm-hmm. So you can't do it. You're not allowed to do You're it. not allowed to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you get caught with it. You, you'll go to jail. You, can go to, you go to jail. So that's number one, mm-hmm. right? The other thing that Tim said is like, you've got to, for him, he's like, if somebody asked me about it, he says, here's the protocol. You, you know, a month of preparation. And the preparation that he's putting on people is like, hey, you gotta meditate every day. You gotta, he's got some books to read. Um, you gotta do that. He said you gotta look at it like if you're getting knee surgery. If you're an athlete and getting knee surgery, what do you do? You go out, you research, you find the best doctor, you do the, there's prep work to get ready to have surgery. You gotta like work out a certain way and do certain exercise to get ready. Then once you get the surgery done, you gotta go into, re, you gotta rehab. Mm-hmm. And you, and it's what you said earlier, like you got to do the work. You, you got to do the work. And like, if you're not willing to put in that work on the front end, you don't respect it enough to do it. You don't have, you don't want to get better. You don't want to use it for mm-hmm. the intent that it needs to be used for, right? Like all these things, I, I take it very serious. Like I don't, I, let me tell you something. Like I, 
I mean, it's even hard for me to talk about. Like, honestly, like it, it just up front, like it's hard for me to even talk about in this room because it's like this is something that I, I in this room a year ago, two years ago, would have looked at like, what are you doing? Right. And it's hard to bring that up around people that I know and trust because if they haven't, you, it's, it's one of those things that if you haven't done it, but then I start thinking to myself, why can I drink alcohol? <laughs> you know what I mean? Why, why can I do all these other things that somebody has allowed me to do? I could go to the VA right now and get prescribed Klodipin. I could get Xanaxes. I could be out of my mind on all these pharmaceuticals. And that's acceptable in our society. And addictive. And addictive and bad for you. But this, this is, even if I have to think about this, even if I have to go through my life, let's say I do this once a quarter, the rest of my life, for five hours, once a quarter. Really? People go to bars. They spend more than that in a bar drinking alcohol <laughs> on the weekends. Yeah. Well, it, what, what, for me, uh, like I said, I've got you. And when you got, I texted you like, well, how was it, man? <laughs> like, <laughs> how was, how was it? And you were like, I feel freaking awesome now. Yeah. And I was like, okay. I mean, like if my friend can escape this pain and this suffering that you're in, like, I want at least other people to know about it. And listen, there's like, there's all kinds of things you need to think about. It's preparation, it's making sure you understand it, it's finding the best doctor, the right place. It's it's also having a safety net in place before you do it because, because it can uncover things that you didn't think were gonna come. Mm. You didn't think this was coming and it, guess it, what? You get hit with it. And it will. You get ambushed. Mm -hmm. So you better have some backup, you better have some safety net. You have to assume that you're gonna need help when you're done with it. Mm -hmm. Um, get in the right environment. He, uh, Tim said, take less than you think you can handle. Everyone's like, oh, I'm just going in hard. <laughs> like, dumb move. Yeah, dumb move. Uh, he, he did also mention a couple places where, there, look, there's, there's John, John Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins University is, is doing all kinds of experimentation to try and figure out how to use it properly. There's a bunch of other places that are doing it as well. There's something called maps.org, M-A-P-S.org, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. That's a, that's a, This is if you wanna support what we're talking about, if you wanna try and get it so it's not underground, right? Because yeah. if you can go get, get prescribed Xanax and whatever these other things that you're talking about, or you can just go down to the freaking corner store and buy a bottle of whiskey and inebriate yourself, mm -hmm which all it does is cover up the problems, numbs the problems. If you would like to say, hey, maybe we should take a different approach, you can go to maps.org, you can go to usonainstitute.org. It's just another, it's U-S-O-N-A-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E.org um, to try you know, to, to donate or whatever you can support there. And then just universities that are out there that are doing this. Um, he told me a couple documentaries that are will help you have better understanding. One of them is called Trip of Compassion. Mm -hmm. And apparently it's super intense. Apparently they show this therapy taking place and it's like like really intense. And the other one is called Fantastic Fungi. Am I saying that right? Fungi? Fungi? Fungi. 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 Which is kind of, I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of, it sounds like a, uh, whatever, almost a comedic right name. And then he told me what it's about. And what it's about is they've got people that are, have some kind of terminal disease, in many cases, older people, but people that are, people like you, what, what we're talking about, where people that would never think about doing anything like this in their lives, and they haven't for 40, 60, 80 years, and they're, they're doing these drugs in order to overcome or be comfortable as they face death. Yeah. And something like he says that there's like grandmas on there that, you know, never drank in their life and they're on there saying this is the best thing that I've ever done. So definitely some um look this again, I'm I'm no pro, do research, but it's something that we need to start talking about because 
if it can help us out, if it's been helping people for a long time anyways, it's, you know, with the case of mushrooms, been helping for thousands of years. If there's something, if there's a way to help people, let's freaking research it. Let's find out how to do it right. And let's, let's get people to a situation where they can do it um, legally. But, but again, doing it with the right intent. Yeah. With the right intent. And I'm telling you, drinking is way easier than going in and facing and, and, and working through what you see with this. Drinking is easier. Um, going and, and, you know, running away from your problems is way easier. This is a, this is a, this is where it's going to, it's going to look you in the eyes and you're going to, if you want to work on it, you'll work on it. I mean, I, and it's so hard. It sounds like even me talking about it, it sounds so crazy just to even talk about it like that. But it's really like, for example, the last time I did, I mean, I, 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 I sit there and looked at my teammates dead, but you know what? I looked at it in a way that I was okay with it. I came out of it and I was okay with it. Yeah. Did I still feel the hurt? Yeah. Did, was I sad? I got to see my grandparents, which I loved more than anything. Uh, but I was okay with it. Yeah. It's okay to, to, to it's a normal reaction to, to hurt from it, to miss them. But it's not normal to let these actions dictate the rest of your life. And that was where it did. It gave me the perspective of seeing it again on my terms. And it and hopefully what that did is it, it processed it and now it's out. Check. <sighs> Proceed with caution. With caution. <laughs> with caution. <laughs> um Let's talk about something that's a little less uh, controversial, but also provides a massive amount of healing, in my humble opinion. A little something called jujitsu. <laughs> How's the jujitsu coming along, man? You know, I, I haven't I haven't rolled much lately. Um, you know, I was rolling quite a bit whenever all the the COVID hit, right? Mm-hmm. Everything got shut down. Um, I, I feel like I'll probably be a white belt for life. Um, you know, um, <laughs> we're all white belts for life. I, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't got to roll a ton lately. I, th- I think I rolled maybe like a month ago, mm-hmm. but I just, I hadn't been able to get back around to, I mean, there's plenty of jujitsu to go on in Austin. Roger that. Uh, Tim Kennedy, just FYI, your brother here has not been rolling lately. I'm sure you will, uh, help yeah. remedy that situation. One of the things that you know for me, jujitsu and is is so important for so many reasons, and it's al- aligned with the reasons of like being in shape, mm-hmm. working out, working out every day. To me, that's that's therapy. That's therapy, right? <clears throat> that's therapy for me, um, and I know it's therapy for a lot of people. And I know, uh, hey, give me one day for where for whatever reason. I literally can't work out, like a, whatever it is. Like I, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning to travel, and then when I got home, the water heater was broken, and I had three clients call me, and then my kid was sick, and whatever, whatever the thing is, it, it just didn't happen. I, I, I can feel it, right? It's like a mental um, um, negative emotion that's going on. Yeah. If I, if it's like seven o'clock at night, my wife's about to serve dinner, and I didn't get to work out, I go, hey. Give me thirty minutes. I'm gonna go hammer one out, man. It's like a whole, whole, the whole world changes. The whole world changes. Name a time that you've worked out and you left, and you were you were not happy that yeah. you worked. Boy, out. Boy, am I bummed I did that. Oh yeah. man. So fitness, huge thing, and I I know that. Speaking of fitness, what's up with this new freaking like application you got out? Yeah, talk to me about this. I just uh, I just launched this new. So like, I've always wanted. Look, I'm I don't I don't want to be a bodybuilder. Like, I have no credibility. I don't have no idea how to even do it. Right. Um, I don't want to be a trainer. I don't want to be any of those. Right. But like, I do enjoy the therapy side of working out of 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 staying in shape of being able to, you know, know that that if we get a fire, I can go perform or knowing that I can get us out, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I still get on a truck to go get after it. Right. Like I, I have to be a dad to my, you know, to my daughters and, and look at some point in a few years when I'm older, they'll be dating boys and I still have to be able to kick their ass. Right. <laughs> so I take that very serious. Um, you know, so I, I still have this, I know how to train and, and to me, you know, 
I feel like the closest I became all my look at look at what all my friends have in common. They all train. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because you know where we got close to our closest friends? Suffering and training together, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it. 100%. And so, you that's know, how you build a team. I launched this new app. It's on own the dash training.com. And um, you can get on there. We got workouts on there. Um, you can work out, same stuff I do, right? It's not about are you going to get on there with a program to come out as a bodybuilder? No, I don't, I don't want to be that. But if you want to get on there and get after it and have a program you can follow to get after it and to be able to leave and know you did something, it's like I call it practical fitness. It's like, you don't, it's not complicated. I'm a simple guy. I get it done where I can. I like to think it's efficient. You know, it's efficient. I just get in what I can with what I got. And that's what it is. So you real quickly, like just mentioned, oh, when I'm out getting on the truck, because mm -hmm. you're a firefighter. Yeah. Firefighter EMT. I did that last year. I got knocked that out last year because, you know, during COVID and I was like, man, I, I really want to get back. I really want to I really want to, I feel like I just, I have more to give. Like this country has given me so much. People have given me so much. And I just, I feel like I, I have an obligation to give. And um, I want to do it by being able to put my hands on people and being able to be there in their worst moments. And so, yeah, I went and got my certification, became an EMT, uh, became a firefighter. I got my commission in Texas. And, um, yeah, so I, um, I, was, I was paid for probably six months, five, four, five, six months. Um, and then just my, my speeches and stuff started coming back. So I had to get off the truck. You know, me and you talked about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah. it wasn't a forever thing. It was more about getting experience and trying to just sharpen that craft. And then, you know, now I still volunteer. And then I'm um, hopefully I'll, I'll start doing some part-time stuff, start picking up some shifts at this, this uh, one of my, one of my closest mentors in, uh, in the fire service, Sam Stacks has just been there for me the whole time and just kind of led me through. Like he's, he's like the, we call him the, you know, you know, the white beards, right? <laughs> like he's like the white beard of the fire service, you know, him and, and, um, he's been their close friend. So anyways, I did that and, you know, I just get out there and try to, try to help people when they need it. And it's, it's awesome, man. I, uh, I, I've talked to a lot of fire departments in the country and a lot of fire departments use the principles from extreme ownership from dichotomy of leadership from leadership strategy and tactics we we, we, we work with these guys a lot and yeah. i i always feel like hey i i appreciate what you guys do i know it's a hard job i know it's like a, a rough job I know that you see a lot of stuff that sucks, and I know that a lot of it is like no, like you, 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 you think of a uh, firefighter, you think of like a movie like Backdraft, yeah. where it's like all kind of dangerous but heroic. Yeah, it ain't that. And the other part of it that I know exists is the part that's like her heroic, yes, but a different kind of yeah. heroic. And man, you and I have had some conversations about that. That even up to my appreciation for firefighters and EMTs even more when you're talking about just the day to day yeah. life. I mean, it is. Yeah. Let me tell you, um, I, first off, let's, let's talk about police and like, uh, EMS side of it, police, paramedics, EMTs. Um, let me tell you, they are the unsung heroes of this this nation um the the strain that is put on our, our them this system that we have um the demand from them they're overworked they're treated like shit um on deployment 365 days a year on oh. deployment 365 days a year and i'm telling you they are dealing with the the peace of the world that we want to pretend does not exist. And it is here. Um, the respect for them is it, if you see a cop or you see a any of them, a first responder, you should thank them and you should thank from the bottom of your heart that, for what they do that you don't have to see. Um, I had no clue. As much as I pretended like I thought I did, I had no clue. The stuff that I see, have seen by just since I've been doing it, 
is is worse than anything I see in Afghanistan. Um, on an almost daily basis. Yeah, I mean, look, you have shifts that nothing goes on, but you have days where it sucks. And um, yeah, it's in it's it, what they go through is just you you can't what what I went through in Afghanistan, which I'm not going to say is for everybody, is, is what everybody's gone through. Um, but it, it can't touch what I've seen here in 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 the United States. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you where it really hit me one time is whenever I uh, I was working on an ambulance, uh, me and my one of my closest friends, um, when we when we pull up and uh, to a call where a kid hung himself. And uh, I'll never forget, it was like a hanging. And I'll never forget, he looked at me. He's way, I mean, this dude is, you talk about solid. Real, he's, he's, he's awesome. He looked at me and goes, hey, make sure when we get out, grab the bolt cutters. He's like, uh, you, you never know, like, if they hung themselves with something other. Like, I never even thought about that, right? Like, this guy just, and you know, you just, you walk in and you just see, you know, it's, you can't, th- this is not war. This isn't somebody shooting at you because they hate you. I mean, this is a kid who was so lonely that he hung himself. And this is what happens. This is happening in our world every day. Has anybody ever thought about who comes and takes care of this? You know, and it's the car wrecks. You know, the, the, you know, it's it's just it's something that we try to pretend that doesn't exist, and you got these people who are just going out and doing this every day. I have no clue as to what they've gone through. I've seen a, just about this much of it, just a, a smidge of it, but they go out and they get up in the middle of the night to go and and be there for when you dial nine one one, and it's like these these people, um, I, I, not me, but these people that I have got to work with that I've got to see who have done this for years, like they really are the real life Batman's Superman. You look at it like, you know, they, when you call them, they go and answer whatever needs you need in the worst moments of your life. And they go back and they live theirs. And they walk the streets among us and they don't ask for anything. And it is crazy. They are they are really God sent. And it's it's incredible. And like, you know, the appreciation I have for them, just getting to work next to them. Um, I just I'm honored to just be able to be around them. But it's you talk about the world, the world right around us. I mean, the houses that you walk into, you're just so sad. I mean, it's the people you see, the overdoses, and, and, you know, you're just like, I'm telling you right now, the one thing that I have have been able to see is that people are hurting. People are hurting. And, uh, yeah, but I'll tell you this, it's it's been the most fulfilling thing I've done. Um, You know, how cool is it to be somebody, uh, to be the person they can show up when somebody calls 911 because they don't know how to figure it out. How cool is that to be able to come up on a scene to where everything's chaotic and they just need somebody to help them get through that moment and you get to be that person, right? And and that's where I think like my perspective has changed on all this, like with my teammates or with all the people I've seen die and and all this like you know what's kind of cool is man is is I um for some reason I keep getting put in these positions and it's an honor because I get to be the person that's there with them as their soul leaves their body. And how cool is that to be able to share that moment with somebody? Their last moments on this earth, I, I get, sometimes I get to share that with them, peop- these people. And it's an honor. Like I walk away and does it bother me? Of course it bothers me. But like now I, I get to say, hey, you know what? It was an honor. It was an honor that you shared that moment with me. Whether you, obviously you didn't choose to, but obviously we're here for a reason. And um, I get to do this. And it is like, it's awesome. It is awesome. It's awesome. I've been uh, lucky enough to work with uh, police departments 
around the country and and what, what's interesting about what you were saying is that like you said it's underneath the surface right and I think when you see something on the news you know you see a shooting on the news or a suicide or an overdose we we have a tendency to think that it's somewhere else yeah it's someone else and I'm telling you small towns big towns cities country rural north south east west you don't have to go very far quote beneath the surface because by the way socioeconomic class doesn't matter does it you go to rich people's houses you go to poor people's houses you go to the projects and there's there's people that are uh, in their worst moments in their worst moments and um like you said it's the, it's these uh, first responders that are out there that re- they they answer that call every time every single time every single time and they do it for years they do it for years end on end and it is like watching them you know just like literally they prepare for the unknown they never know what the call is going to be like they literally wake up every day to be whatever you need them to be when they need to be it and i'm telling you and they do it and they do it they're it's such a like police especially like police such a thankless job obviously right now right and they're out there doing their best and they're out there just trying to just trying to 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 be what people need them to be and at the end of the day they're no different than you are they're a mother they're a sister they're a father they're a son they're no different than you are. The only difference is, is that they chose to put a badge on to go serve other people. That's it. They're not, they're not some trained robot. They're not some person who is, you know, was, was born with all these mind reading activities or can read the future to know if someone's going to kill them tonight. They are just like you are. They are as scared as you are. They, they don't want to do, like, they got their own problems at home, and guess what they do? They choose to set theirs aside, and, and they don't, let me tell you up front, they don't do it for the pay. They do not do it for the pay. They, they, they don't do that. No. They do it because they care about people. I don't care. Their intent, they don't stay in that job without good intent. It's, it's not possible. It is not possible. It ain't worth it. It is not worth it. <laughs> but it's awesome, man. It's awesome. Like, it's just awesome. Like, I, I I would get on a truck with these guys, and I would just look at them in awe of just, like, no matter how chaotic it got, they they had it. And it was like, this is awesome. I want to be one of them. How often do you walk around and say that? I want to be one of them. Mm-hmm. It's badass. They're badass. Man. Salute. Uh, you mentioned a couple times today the new book. Yeah. The new book coming out. Tell us about the new book. The Way Forward. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book. You know, me and Rob O'Neill, we, we speak for the same um, speaking agency. Mm-hmm. Um, me and Rob connected on not necessarily about, like, combat stuff, mm-hmm. but just more about the this life. Right, we both come from small towns. Um, we both are somewhere that neither one of us, you know, ever thought we would be. Right, you know, and um, we both have stuff that haunts us, and that was kind of where we connected. Of like, how do we put a book together, kind of talking about giving some perspective that we're no different than anybody else. And, you know, and that's the one thing that I always felt like a lot of these war books came back like right after, you know, these war books came out and I feel like all the way up until Chris Kyle's movie, Mm -hmm. there wasn't really that humanization piece, right? In Chris Kyle's movie, they, they showed more of the, when he was coming back home between deployments, the struggle sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first time in any of the movies that it ever really hit. And, you know, 
I always felt like in our books that we wrote, we, we built ourselves up to be something great, but we never showed that we never humanized the factors of war. And, you know, that was a piece that always got me and, uh, we're kind of like when I came home. And so like, you know, in the way forward, it's just about, it's about life. Like a lot of stories I told today, you know, the Ibogain story is in there, right? Like the, you know, the, the story I talk about my grandpa, you know, just about, you know, the, the, the circle, I talk about my circle and why I talk about Tim Kennedy, the story I told you, I, I put that in there about how, like between Tim, Shane and, and Brandon, uh, my friends about how, like, um, you know, you, you got the sword, the shield and the armor, right. And, and those are like that, um, that, that how each of them fit. And, you know, I talk about, you know, my struggles in Alaska. I talk about not, you know, about like my divorce. I talk, you know, I, I talk about all this. I talk about more of the human side of it to humanize about who we are. And, and you know, and I think it's going to be great. It comes out in July and I think it's going to be great because at, a, at, you know, I think it's coming at a, probably a good time in the country of where people are looking for a way forward. Right. And that's kind of where it, where it comes around. So what's the layout? What's the, la- the, the normally, as you know, I read books before people come on here. But in this case, you handed it to me I today did. and said, I "Got did. a new book coming new out." Book. So, yeah. uh, what's the format of it? So basically, in each chapter, um, Rob tells a story, mm-hmm. I tell a story. And, for each uh, chapter, for each chapter, is there a common theme between? Yeah, the, yeah. So, uh, like, if you look at, like, if you, you know, when when you read it, you I know, can't. You, I haven't looked at it because yeah. uh, you know what? You uh, didn't give it to me I until know. today. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's so, your tricky way of getting back here again. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> you like that, right? Um, so, you know, you talk about like American boys, like that's the first chapter, taking aim, um, find your heroes, um, you know, drilling, open your eyes. Like, I, you know, I talk about, I, I kind of, you know, like one of the stories I, I talk about in here that I, I felt like, you know, my cousin Steven was, I mean, you talk about a guy who was always there for me, right? And uh, especially one of my biggest cheerleaders when I went to the Marine Corps. And, um, man, when I came back and I was just in that, this dark mode, um, you know, he had, he had had a kid and married and all this and like, he got busy. Right. And, you know, he just wasn't answering the phone and I took it as, well, he's like leaving me, leaving me hanging. Right. But really now that I'm a father, I get it. Um, so me and him got into it pretty bad. And like, I tell you, I, uh, over it just because of ego and resentment. Um, I invited everybody in my family except him to the Medal of Honor ceremony. And, uh, you know, man, I, that's one of the dudes that stood by me the whole time, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, just, just stuff like that, like lessons of hopefully if I can't meet somebody that they can read this book and, and maybe it touches their life to say, Hey, you know what? Maybe I'm doing this in my life right now before I go and, and mess it up even worse. You know, maybe I, you can look at this as, as a little bit of perspective that maybe, maybe some mentorship, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, it's just all stories about that, that you should be able, you know, everybody could relate to whether you served in combat or you didn't. And Rob's is the same way, you mm-hmm. know, Rob's is talking about, um, basketball about growing up in, you know, Butte, Montana. I mean, Rob has got some funny stories. I'm laughing because um, Rob and I were on deployment. It was like 99 or 2000. And I don't even think we had aimed. We went, like, went to the gym to work out. And there were some dudes playing basketball. Yeah. And I played basketball. I sucked, but like I played basketball in high school, you know, and I was a point guard, so I could like dribble, I had some ball handling skills, yeah. I could pass and whatnot. But I, I would like get more steals in a game than I would points, oh, right? Yeah. Partially because of my position, but partially because I, I, and I was host, like I was a hustler, right? I would yeah. be, I'd every game I'd leave with like skin knees and skin elbows because I dive on every ball. <laughs> well, well, Rob's like uh, he played a little bit of college ball. Yeah. And being from Montana, most of the time you find with people that are from the north, they're really good at shooting because you know you can't dribble in the winter time, so you just sit out there and shoot shoot hoops. So he could he could he could shoot, yeah. and we're like walking across you know in our running shoes, ready to go work out, and there's some guys you know playing some ball, and we had one, I think we had one or two other guys with us, yeah. 
and you know rob you know constantly talking shit to everybody you know he said something like oh nice shot you know and the dudes were like oh you guys want some and rob's like yeah yeah and you know these kids were wearing you know air jordans yeah. and white, like they were like they were ready to run some game on us yeah nike shocks yeah yeah <laughs> nike shocks and stuff and rob i mean i get no you He's a little taller, right? What's he? Yeah. Six one? Probably, yeah, six foot, six one. Yeah. yeah, maybe six one. But you're not looking at him thinking he's a baller, especially he's no. like you know a, a pale white dude with red hair. <laughs> with red hair. And you know, uh, so they're looking at us like, oh, these nerds. Yeah. And sure enough, man, like he, it's a great combo because I could I had good ball handling yeah. and I could just I was just feeding him and he's just hitting jump shot, jump <laughs> shot, outside shot, jump shot. We just destroyed him yeah. and then we walked off. With Rob still talking shit, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I mean, you know, I, um, I, I love Rob Death, uh, gr- great guy, um, I, you know, he's he's always been. I tell you what, he's been one of my biggest cheerleaders, um, yeah, and it was just, it was, we wrote this book together. I think it's, you know, it's gonna be good, you know. Hopefully, it gets out there and helps people, and yeah, you know, it's gonna be awesome. Right on. Well, I look forward to uh, reading it now that I have a copy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What's the future? What else you got coming up? You know, I, you know, getting, you know, get, we're going to do this book tour starting July. Um, we're out there. We're uh, pushing the discipline go, right? The best flavor there is, Dak Savage. Oh, that's right. Just so you know, Dak Savage. Um, Dak Savage. So you got your own energy drink is what I'm hearing. Well, I don't. I have my own flavor, yes. But, okay, uh, well, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, yours, da- right? <laughs> Dak Savage, you know, um, it's. Uh, When's the tour taking place? July. J- July. And then what do you go? You guys are going to different cities. Yeah, so you know we're. Well, I guess we'll see, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, we're waiting. Oh, because Miss Rona. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I guess they're like they're doing virtual book signings, so we're gonna have those going. But Got it. but you know, me and Rob both have talked that we want to get on the road. Like we want to go out and see people. I want to honestly, man, I just want to go and get around people and and be able to fire people up, get them excited about life again. You know, get them excited that look, it's, it's gonna be all right. Like we're gonna we're gonna get through this. You know, get out get out of the TV. Get get out of get get t- turn turn the news off. Get off get off social media, and um, stop believing what people tell you, and just look around and believe what you see, mm-hmm. right? And um, yeah, so that that's that's that. You know, that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing, crushing it. Well, before we jump into this support, I kind of wanted to wrap this up, um, bringing it back to to Colonel Charles Whittlesley, Whittlesey. Um, So at his memorial service, there was a, a, a friend of his family. This is in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. They had a memorial service. And this family friend, who is also a judge, a guy by the name of Charles Hibbard, he, uh, he delivered the, the eulogy. And this is what he said. Quote, we can sit here and say, He had so much to live for, family, friends, and all that makes life sweet. But no, my friends, life's span for him was measured those days in that distant forest. He had plumbed the depth of tragic suffering. He had heard the world's applause. He had seen and touched the great realities of life. And what remained was of little consequence. He craved rest, peace, and sweet forgetfulness. He thought it out quietly, serenely, confidently, Minutely. He came to a decision not lightly or unadvisedly, and in the end, did what he thought was best. And in the comfort of that, we too must rest. Hmm. End quote. And 
I disagree. I don't think we can rest. I don't think we should rest. I think we must not rest. What I think we should do is help. I think we need to help our veterans that are suffering and and not just veterans but people from all walks of life because life is hard and no matter who you are you either are facing or you will be facing disappointment and despondency and loss. But don't give up. Just, you gotta keep fighting. You gotta get out of that echo chamber that your head is trapped in. You gotta build relationships with people. And you gotta move forward. Not just for yourself, but for the people around you. So let's not rest. Let's help. Thanks for coming on, man. No, thanks for having me. And, you know, like like with what you're saying on, you know, that, that end quote, I agree. <clears throat> I, mean, I tell people all the time, um, you do matter. You do. Like the biggest lies you, yeah, you biggest lies that are told are the ones you tell yourself. And and you know what? Just as the good times, they don't all last forever, neither do the bad. And you do matter. You do matter. Somebody somewhere is relying on you. Somebody somewhere, whether you've met them yet or not, they will be relying on you and you do matter. And I'm with you. Look, it's there's nothing weak about it. There's nothing. Struggle is struggle. You know, a lot of times people, they see us as, as that, 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 you know, we, we don't struggle or we don't have hard days because we don't necessarily walk around and talk about it all the time. But like the hardest, even the hardest people on earth, they got hard, not because of easy times. They got hard because of hard days and they got through it. And it's a choice. And you just have to continue to choose to get through it. And it's worth it. Indeed. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. It's a freaking honor to have you on here. Echo Charles. Yes, sir. I'm not quite 100% sure that it's an honor for me to have you on here, but it's pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It's an honor for you me. Like the, oh, thank it's you. Honor thank you, Dakota Meyer. <laughs> it's always yeah. an honor for me to be in your presence. Yeah, it's a very, very big pleasure for you. We want to help yeah. ourselves. We want to help others. What do you recommend? Select. Uh, what do you mean? Hey, do you still uh, fly your helicopter? I, I sold it, but I'm getting another one. Oh. Are you getting like a better one? I don't know. Or what just I'm a different one? <laughs> just a different one. Why was that one no good? He's like no, a they, better one. They, like they only have like they only have like so many hours. Was that one getting close to the end? Yeah. What do you mean, like like a projector light bulb kind of thing? Well, like after like so many hours, they have to be rebuilt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. What what model was that one that you it had? R forty four Raven two. And those are like very common. Yeah. Uh, they're, uh, like, they're like the Toyota Corolla yeah, yeah, of helicopters. Yeah. 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 What's funny is I thought of this video idea a while yeah. ago, like last year. So I. I Let's do it. Now I, he's he's I, in the execution phase I now. Did. So he he likes to he likes. Well, it's to. too bad you sold it. <laughs> no, no, I got I got we get my buddies. I, we got like four or five of them out there. So oh, okay. let's do it. Well, I gained access to a 3D model of your helicopter, oh, and, I, and I, I saw little videos of it. So I'm like, and so I made it look like yours. So I was gonna do something, but <laughs> I didn't do it yet. But you know, it's, it's he's, it's, he's it's been incubating the idea for a year. Yeah. That's what kind of 
you know activity we got yeah, going so on I'm over st- there I'm still doing my research <laughs> hey the last podcast that just came out um it's two oh, i think it's 275 yeah 275 helicopter pilot from vietnam and they're it, the best it, you, you you usually check it out for sure because yeah. he, he's just flying that huey and we kind of got more into the like a just questions about like flying that thing and how hard it is to fly a helicopter and there was one quote in there his dad was a master chief in the navy so this guy's a freaking warrant officer or whatever warrant officer two yeah and his dad is a master chief in the navy was a master chief became like lieutenant commander in the navy and then goes to see him or, or no he's stationed in saigon the, the dad's in Saigon, like we're doing some bureaucratic, whatever, logistics thing, and the son's up freaking flying ops every day. He, he goes and picks up his dad and brings him up to wherever they were out in the bush and starts flying missions with his dad. His dad's on the 50 cal. His dad's like, his dad's like 45 years old, like a lieutenant commander up there just get, they get into firefights, bro. His dad's on the 50 cal. Anyways, his dad says to him, like, after a couple days, he goes, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of Air Force guys, and those Air Force, those jet fighter pilots, you know, they're always so positive, they're always having such a good time, and you guys are all miserable and walking around like everything's horrible. What's up with that? And he says, well, Dad, an uh, Air Force fighter pilot is flying an aircraft that wants to fly, that, that if you don't do anything, it's kind of going to just keep flying. Yeah. He goes, we're flying something that doesn't want to fly. It wants to it's crash. Not made to fly. And if we don't balance these four different things, it's going to go down. Mm-hmm. And we're close enough to the ground that people are shooting at us with machine guns and RPGs and everything else. <laughs> On top of it. So you want to know why we're freaking stressed? That's why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question, Dad. <laughs> you talk about a father-son relationship yeah, after that. Yeah, dude. Freaking crazy, right? It's crazy. Yeah. Hey, Dad, I'm going to come pick you up and I'm going to take you on to run some. They did three days of operations. That's crazy. Dude. His dad shot. And it, look, his dad shot a 50 cal. He was shooting a 50 cal out of the out of the Huey. That's got to move a Huey a little bit, don't you think? Yeah. Like, g- 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 like you're moving a little bit. I don't know. I mean, no, they got so much power. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those things are. Yeah. Damn, but the thing but, yeah. is, like, they they do, but it's weird Talking to him, it's the first time that I really got the feeling of like, man, how in touch with those aircraft those guys were. Yeah, like, like you you can't be reactive. Like it's like balancing yourself on a beach ball. Yeah, and it's part of them. Yeah. Oh. They, they flew to the point where it's part of them. And so that's why I say like when, the, like there'd be like a, a little thing like uh, they could tell like how much weight they had on. They're oh, yeah. like, oh, we're 100 pounds heavy. Like how do you tell you're 100 pounds heavy on a freaking helicopter? The way it right? picks up, yeah. They could, they were just, they just knew everything, and they were so in touch with those birds. Mm-hmm. It's freaking nuts, man. Yeah, it's the power load. Yeah, how much power it takes to come off. Oh yeah, freaking crazy. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Awesome. So Echo Charles, yeah. trying to get better. Yes. Trying to be better. Mm-hmm. What do you recommend? Well, well, let's start with uh, these illustrious healthy energy drinks you know we don't all have our f- own flavor maybe some of us do some of us don't How about maybe that? some of us have one coming some of us don't but either way flavor whichever flavor these are good things tell us about uh it was kind of interesting how did you how did you end up with this who'd you talk to you oh it was me <laughs> <laughs> Since you're so in touch, man. I don't good. remember, man. Yeah. I don't remember. Would you call me up and say, hey, I should have my own flavor? <laughs> no. No, you you said it after I oh, after yeah. I got rhabdo on oh, the other right. energy drink. Right. And you're like. I was like, oh, no. that's right. I remember saying, bro, you can't be drinking that stuff. Yeah. What's in it? It's this, 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 this. I went through everything. Like, bro, mm-hmm. let me send you some real shit. Yeah. And then you're like, we'll make your own flavor. Yeah. Then I said, what flavor do you want? Yeah. What flavor do you like? <laughs> do you see? How did he forget? No, what, how, did, how are you going to ask? No, he's got a lot on his plate. I remember that yeah. now. <laughs> I remember that now. Uh, but I remember saying, like, well, what flavor do you like? And you're like, I like Dr. Pepper. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. All right. We okay. can work with that. Because that's a cult following, Dr. Pepper. It is. People, is a cult following. But who wants to drink uh, uh, high fructose corn syrup? Who wants to drink that? Probably nobody if they knew the reality. Nobody you know? wants to drink nobody. that. 
So but, what we're talking about is this uh, drink right here. Well, his drink is called Dak Savage. Dak Savage. It is black cherry vanilla. Mm-hmm. It's totally healthy for you. How many did you drink? You just drank three? I drank three too. <laughs> you guys are fired up, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's cool. We well, have to drink three to stay on your level. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. I can't even remember that I had a conversation with you about this. <laughs> know, <laughs> All right, so we got we got these awesome drinks. If you want to get one, go to get some. Go to jockofuel.com and you can order them. You can also get them from Wawa on out on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. By the way, Wawa, by the way, Wawa put like put the brakes on me a little bit. They told They're you like, to slow hey. your roll. Well, because people were like going in there and buying all of them, <laughs> and we had to get our supply chain caught back up. Sure. Supply chain is caught back up. So roll, roll on, roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go get some. Clear yeah. those shelves. Dak Savage. Yeah. Dak Savage. <laughs> Dak Savage is your flavor. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Yeah. What else? Interesting. These drinks is like one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, I'm trying to improve. Let me do a, a I don't know, a pre workout. We'll we'll call it a, a, a traditional pre workout energy drink scenario. Mm-hmm. That's t- technically, I mean, it's that's like a short term, oh very on the path thing with long term detriments. Yeah, I was gonna say it's not just short term. Like, oh, but I feel good for a minute. No, and yeah. now I legitimately am going backwards. I'm less healthy. Literally less mm-hmm. healthy. Yeah. Don't do that, man. This is not like that. This is short-term and long-term, straight up. Straight up. Tactical and strategic victory. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, you know, know, those combination, ancient combination locks on those old school movies? I don't know. Indiana Jones. I don't know. One one of these deals. I've seen Indiana Jones. But but it's impossible to do. It's actually not on Indiana Jones, I don't think. Maybe it is. Either way, it's it's like that. You figured out the combination. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Got the short-term and the long-term. And it's healthy. And it tastes good. Damn. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 Incredible metaphor. Also, speaking of (laughs) tasting good, we've got some additional protein supplementation called milk. Mm -hmm. I've been on that. I've been on the train. This past week, man. I have been too, actually. Hey, is it a, is it a violation? And I always am, actually. <laughs> well, you know how it all goes. I got a know. sweet. I got a sweet tooth. Okay, is this I a like violation? Dessert. Let me put it to you that way. You, I don't think you've done this, but this may have been done from other people other than just me. Put dark chocolate chips in the milk. Bruh. Come on. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't done that. Okay. But I've done probably something equally... What is it? Is this a violation, you think? Yeah, that's the question, yeah. I don't think it's a violation, but I have put ice cream yeah, yeah. straight up into my milk. Yeah, the, it, we'll say it's not a violation, but you're pushing it. Here's the thing. I did it, and I was like, okay, it wasn't worth it. Yeah, it, it kind of, yeah, the enhancement I was like, oh, you know, it's going to be, so, no. no. Yeah. The reason for milk is because it already tastes like dessert. It's like, can you have something... Can dessert taste more like dessert? Not yeah. really, in my opinion. Yes, yeah, like like I don't know if you like Rocky Road ice cream, but let's say no. you're gonna be like, I don't hey, like marshmallows. I'm gonna okay, all right, cool, I dig it, man. But what if let's say you did s'mores? No, okay, I'm marshmallows? No. However, Lucky Charms back in the back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> See Jocko just eating the freaking mushrooms out of the Lucky Charms. Oh, you're that man. guy, bro. I you know, I, t- I take I the milk, and what I do is I mix water with it, and I put it in a bowl in the morning. And I'll mix water with it, and then I'll like make a pudding out of it, and I'll put it in the. Uh, mm. I just so I do it first thing in the morning, and then I'll put it in the refrigerator, mm. and then when I come home in the evening, I eat it like that. Oh. It's like pudding. <laughs> Damn, pudding. That's interesting. Hey, so and you're just telling me this right now. So basically, you just like you, you can't put too much water. Mm-hmm. So you just put like you just put like a little bit of water in there, and then see if it mixes it up. And if you need just a little bit more, you put it in there until it's basically like a uh, like mud, like mud, and then you stick it in the refrigerator. And it is, listen. Well, what flavor after. do you? What flavor do you do? Well, so I, I like. I mean, I love the pumpkin. Uh, Interesting. The pumpkin is like <laughs> it's like pumpkin pie. <laughs> he just looked like an <laughs> addict when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I like the pumpkin. And we talked about the to- the DMT toad earlier. Oh, you yeah. look more excited yeah. about the pumpkin. Oh, oh yeah. Pumpkin over here. You gotta get on the pumpkin, the man. Pumpkin. You gotta get on the pumpkin. <laughs> That does make sense, though, because if I don't add enough, whether it be milk, you know, when you make it in the blender the normal way, if I put a little bit of peanut butter in it, though, sometimes, mm. so I've... Even I've, in the peanut butter flavor? Yeah, yes, sir. Sometimes, okay. Yeah. Sometimes. You're going to OD on peanut butter, but it's all good. It's very possible. But there had been times where I didn't put enough milk or I put too many scoops in there. Mm. And yeah, after I blended it up, I was like, oh, this is kind of like almost like a pudding. Mm. 
now you know yeah. to throw so it in now the fridge. It makes sense. Throw, it, throw it in the fridge. Throw it in the fridge. Oh, and, good. oh it's listen, you'll call me after you do that. <laughs> and we'll say thank you. You're yeah, welcome. Praise be to Dakota. <laughs> so, so boom, again, another another uh short term, long term payoff situation right there, man. Tastes Tactical good. and strategic good. victory. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So yes, go to Jocko Fuel. That's where you can get all this stuff. Jockofuel.com. Vitamin shop. You can get a vitamin shop too. Oh yes, sir. If you need vitamin to get shop. it. Boom. Local. Yep. Also, there's some other cool supplements on there. Vitamin D3, joint warfare, super krill oil for your joints. We don't want to worry about that kind of stuff. We don't want to worry about getting sick. No. Let mm-hmm. your immune system worry about that, and you just worry about your immune system. Give it vitamin D3. You don't worry about that kind of <laughs> stuff anymore. That's my point. You feel me? You see, what, you see what I'm saying? Anyway, you can get this stuff also at originusa.com. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of stuff on originusa.com, by the way, aside from Choco Fuel Supplements, which yeah. is American made. Geese. Geese. Jiu Jitsu geese. Rash guards. Jiu Jitsu rash guards or other purposes. Do you, what do you use a rash guard for? Uh, so, I mean, I don't, I don't usually wear a rash guard, but I wear those shorts uh, as underwear. Oh, dang. Let which, me tell you something. Which ones? Well, either. Which ones? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, the. Because there's like the actual underwear. Oh, like not those. No, the ones like that have the uh, the Constitution on them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. American flag. Yeah, yeah. Jiu Jitsu spats or the yeah. The, those the, are well, yeah. Those are those are supposed to be underwear, bro. Oh, <laughs> so you're actually using them in the correct manner. Yeah, yeah. yeah wearing perfect. underwear is underwear. Bro. <laughs> what happens when you <laughs> roll it? What happens when you roll in them without underwear? Oh, that so could let me be ask strange. You that. Really? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dakota, uh, Mike, you I do, don't know man, you do what that, you bro. do, bro. Hey, I'm going to come, I'm gonna come roll with you in my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, bro, Dean Lester, you know Dean Lester is, right? Yeah. yeah, he's the man. So, yeah, that's great. I'm glad he's the man. Um, <laughs> here's the deal. Like, in the early jiu-jitsu days, there was, like, this thing in Brazil where they would wear, like, it's called a sung, it's called a sunga. sunga. And then there's a lo- a longer one is called a sungao. Mm-hmm. But a shorter one's called, like, a sunga. It's basically a freaking pair of Speedos. And Dean had something like that's sort of like in between the two. Like, but they're freaking basically hot pants. Yeah. I mean, it's basically a speedo. And and he'd roll with me, you know? <laughs> and, and and like, you know <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can get yeah, a pair. And it's just a freaking nightmare. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad that those things went out of style. <laughs> How was it passing the guard? Uh, dude, it's just awful. An adventure. <laughs> it, 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 tell you what, it's not as bad as North South. I'll tell you that. It's a freaking nightmare. Like you want to talk probably, about PTSD, bro? Probably better. I got freaking a damn animal, <laughs> male animal in a pair of white, tidy whiteies, freaking all up on me. Yeah. North South with him on top. Uh, either way, bro. <laughs> but at least, at least if I'm on top, I can maneuver. Like we're not doing. North, I'm going cross side, knee on belly. I might even just run away. <laughs> yep. Nightmares. I need ibogaine to freaking recover from that. Yeah. Mentally scarred. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you're right about that. By the way, also at mm. Origin Maine, we got some uh, American made denim jeans, boots. Boom. Mm. Anyway, check that out. It's a good spot. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. It's where you can get shirts, hats, hoodies, lightweight, and regular heavy-ish weight hoodies. Discipline equals freedom. Good. All this stuff. When you want to represent while you're on this path, boom, that's the the place to get your stuff. We also have a, a subscription scenario going on. It's called the Shirt Locker. It's a good one. New shirt every month. Different designs. They're interesting. I saw anyway. someone was hyped on social media about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Best thing ever. They had the All Your Excuses Are Lies t- t-shirt. That's a good one. You came up with that. I respect you for it. Yeah. Deeply. But, yeah, that's a good one. Look, look at that one. It bounced for you. Hey, check. Uh, uh, get that. It's good. Chocostore.com. Uh, we also have some podcasts. Uh, what's your status with your podcast? So, I'm doing. So, me and Dan Holloway do the American Party podcast. The American Party podcast. Yeah. So what happened to Front Toward Enemy? So when COVID hit, I just couldn't get guests in. Uh, that kind of like. Okay, so you're back in the game with yeah. Dan. What's it called? The American Party podcast. So basically we just kind of talk about like what's going on in the world. And we, you know, put common sense logic. Um, Sometimes with, those things are good. With the situations <laughs> that are going on right now. Right on. 
right on awesome so check that out how many how many how long have you been doing that for uh since like november okay so it's so that's right around when you stop i think your last episode of front tour we came out and then we and you just rolled right into that yeah because it's just like i couldn't get into like interviewing people over zoom zoom and i was like i'm out yeah, it's different. It's, it's different. It's yeah. hard to connect with them. Yeah. I've done a couple of them. Not for, for this one. We're trying to maintain the live situations. I've done a bunch of Zoom. And look, it's Zoom is Zoom is real close. Depending on what you're going to talk about. If people yeah. are just going to talk about, you know, whatever, some whatever, like not totally surface topics, but if you're not going deep, you know, yeah. we're good. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do Zoom. If you're if you're doing an interview, like a, maybe a standard, yeah. for lack of a better term, interview, like, hey, this is going on. What do you feel about this, yeah. Dakota yeah. Meyer? Then then yeah, we yeah. wait for Dakota Meyer's answer. Oh, yeah. yeah. All day. Cool. But it's but hard, hard to have a conversation, conversation. over Zoom. Exactly right. Exactly right. So check out that uh, podcast from Dakota. Also, we you can subscribe to this podcast if you want. And... <laughs> Echo used to seem to think that there was a lot of people that were like purposely not subscribing. Um, <laughs> under what, the look what? on your face when I when I ascribe when I when I put thoughts into your head and yeah. words into uh, your mouth. I'm, I'm trying to. You look remember. so puzzled because you look you you trust me. Yeah, and so you well, got a look on your face like, wait, did I really do that? No. Okay. Anyways, that's me trying to re- recall when I. That, that's what I'm saying. Gave you, you that impression. You trust me. You yeah, trust me yeah. that I'm that I'm not sitting here just making things up, which I just did. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. All right. So I Echo never said that. Anymore. Trust is <laughs> trust you. is broken. <laughs> no, bro. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to subscribe to this podcast, go ahead and do it. Leave a review or whatever. I also have a Jocko Unraveling podcast with Daryl Cooper. New one just came out. They're they're freaking. It's a good place to learn grounded podcast about jiu-jitsu warrior kid podcast some new episodes just dropped So you can check that out if you want. We also have the Jocko underground dot com Sure, which is a another it's it's look what it is It's a way for us to build a network that we don't have to rely on anybody else We don't have to rely on else platforms. We don't have to rely on any advertising nothing like that So if you want to help out you want to support you can go to Jocko underground dot com you can join that and as a as a thank you, we do another freaking podcast and answer questions. I'm and now I'm starting to cover little topics, yeah. little Get some good topics, <laughs> little topics yeah. to give people some perspective because because not everything is a Jocko podcast, yes. right? There's a certain you. First of all, you can't have a Jocko podcast. Really, that's like 18 minutes long. Yeah, I mean, you could, but it wouldn't be what people are expecting. Well, and normally, we don't like to do that. So we made this other podcast talking about different topics, educational topics, life topics. It's not all about to do with war and all that stuff. It's not all all leadership. It's but but it, of course it does include those things as well. So anyways, if you want to check that out, how's this for a topic? Yo, yeah, let me see your opinion. It's my preliminary thought. I think I might have sent it to you. Might not mm-hmm. have. The fights you used to get into. Not like as an adult, but you know, mm-hmm. like as, as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, like you get into like your first fight. Scraps. Like what was that? Oh, and yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. And then go up through high school. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not gonna. Yeah, s- yeah. I'm not gonna put. I don't know what your actual experience is, but I thought of it because I was talking with my wife, and she like reminded me of something that I said it, and then she was like, "Oh, you're this bad kid." And then I'm like, "Yeah, well, when you condense all the fights I ever got mm-hmm. in in my life, kind of seemed like I was this bad kid." But it was kind of interesting to kind of go through those. And like Debrief. compare, yeah, it's like you compare your mindset like as a kid and then versus as a, as an adult. It's yeah, I got some. Yeah, got that's some interesting. That's ones. literally the next thought I had was like, I wonder if like, because you know how you you went through like some sh- stuff. Yeah. You know, with the especially in the hardcore scene yeah, and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, And then it's like it's a different, it, that's a different community, we'll say. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's weird to look back at those days. It's very strange to look back at those days now. Yeah. Very strange. So it's like, yeah, that'd be really interesting. Because it's just a different, like what you were saying earlier, Dakota, about being just younger. Yeah. I mean, when I was like 15, like my whole partially developed brain (laughs) just filled with testosterone and rage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, We got some interesting topics on there. So if you want to... uh, it costs money, $8.18 a month. Again, this is how we're building a contingency plan in case things go sideways. We'll still have a way to get this information out. If you can't afford that, it's all good. We got you. Just email assistance at underground 
at jockounderground.com and we'll hook it up. It's true. We got a YouTube channel. Yeah. It's official. Official. It's called Jocko Podcast. Is that what it's called? Yep, sure it's called is. Jocko Podcast. <laughs> and the good videos on there, I am the assistant director of. Uh-huh. Okay. So you can check those out. Yes, hey, sir. Origin, also Origin has a little, uh, has a channel. HD. A little HD that they put out. If you want to know what's happening up at Origin as we rebuild America. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, pretty soon, it looks like it could be also, if you want to see what's going on down there with Origin. Because we, we might be expanding in some other states. Some other opportunities are out there. So we continue to bring back manufacturing not just to maine not just to new england but to america at large which is what we're looking to do yeah it's true also psychological warfare is an album that we put out a few years ago by the way mm-hmm. still doing well what it does is what you do is you listen to these tracks of jocko letting you know how to get past these moments of weakness if they come about which Works. they probably will they will from time to time for sure and if you might want a visual representation of maybe how to overcome some weakness, you can go to flipsidecanvas.com. That's right. Flipside Canvas, where you can get all your motivation you need to hang up anywhere. You can um, you can do canvas prints. We have um, infused metal. Um, we have, or you can just get a, you know, like a poster, like a, it's all the motivation you need. Who owns that company? I know them. <laughs> Hey, Dakota has a company. You hear me talk about it every episode. FlipsideCanvas.com. Where, where'd you come up with the fl- name Flipside? You know, the, the last thing that my uh, that Kenefix said to me um, when he kicked off that morning, he said, uh, Myra, I'll see you on the flip side. And um, that's where the name came from. You know, Flipside Canvas, just trying to do, do a l- another little part of changing the world, the same thing that he stepped off to do that day. And... Um, yeah, that's where it comes from to motivate, to be able to inspire people. You know, um, you know, I, I figured out like when we look at something, you know, when we when we view something, it, it makes us feel a certain way. It's connected. You know, our eyes are connected right to our soul. And then, um, you know, so that's where the art came from of like, how do we put things out to where people see this and feel something that inspires them? And that's that's where flip side comes from. And also, on top of all that, once again, bringing manufacturing back to America because it's all made. All made in America. Made it's in Austin, America. Texas. Made in Austin, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Go to flipsidecanvas.com. Check out all the cool designs and stuff that you can hang on the, on your wall. Got a bunch of books. Obviously, Into the Fire, which was Dakota's first book. His new book, along, along with Rob O'Neill, it's called The Way Forward. So you can pre-order that thing right now. That way you can get your first a dish. A dish. Uh, you can get my novel. What Jocko write a novel about? Oh, you write about some war thing? No, he wrote it about a laundromat. He wrote it uh, about a 1982 Buick Century wagon. He wrote it about a big box store, and he wrote it about brotherhood. Brotherhood. So if you want to check that out, check that out. It's coming out in November. And by the way, if you pre-order it, you'll get a first edition. If you don't, you're not getting first edition because there's no way that my <coughs> publisher thinks that people are going to buy this. They're like, oh, you know, he's a, uh, who's this guy? He's a, uh, he wrote a, uh, uh, hey. right? <laughs> yeah. Who's yeah. going to buy a novel? He's mm-hmm. a knuckle dragger. Cool. You keep thinking that. If you want to get that first edition, order up. Final spin. Otherwise, Appro- when you approach me with your second, third edition, it is brutal. Guess what? It's not getting signed. Approach me with a bowed head. I'll sign it, <laughs> but bow your head. Bow, in, your, bow your head in shame. Don't watch me while I sign this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bow your head in shame because you didn't get in the game early enough. The book is called Final Spin: Laundry Mats, Station Wagons, and Brotherhood Sacrifice. It's a poem, possibly. I just had to. Re- I just did the final edits. Oh damn! Okay. I gotta start reading little chunks of that thing on here. Get it. Get people. From- <laughs> All right. Um, leadership strategy and tactics. Field manual code evaluations protocols discipline equals freedom. Field manual. Way the warrior kid. One, two, three, and four. Mikey and the dragons. About face by Colonel David Hackworth. I wrote the forward on the new edition. Extreme ownership, dichotomy, of leadership. The OG of Jocko Books that I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. We got Echelon Front, Leadership Consultancy, 
where we solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details. We got EF Online just coming at you. Got a bunch of new courses that we just put up that that get granular on the leadership principles we talk about all the time. We got the musters. We are executing the muster. Orlando, May 25th and 26th. Phoenix, August 17th and 18th. Las Vegas, October 28th and 29th. Everything that we've ever done has sold out. So if you want to come, you got to you got to register early extremeownership.com to check those out. We got EF Battlefield coming up. If you want to walk the hallowed grounds at the Battle of Gettysburg and learn the lessons from history that came from that battle, go to echelonfront.com slash events and register. It's like 30 people or 35 people. We sold out the first one. We opened up another one. It, it's battlefield walk the battlefield we have dinner we have lunch we have q a face to face it's like you want to come and and you want to come and squeeze my brain for info come to that thing and then if you want to help service members active and retired their families gold star families you can check out mark lee's mom mama lee she's got a charity organization if you want to donate or you want to get involved go to america's mighty warriors.org if you want more of my bona fide blathering or you need more of echo's cumbersome communications <laughs> you can find us on the interwebs on twitter instagram which echo only refers to as the gram and facebook echoes at echo charles i am at a, a jocko willink dakota First of all, you have a website, which is dakotameyer.com. How do we get the app? Uh, go to ownthe-training.com. Can you search for it on a Apple Store or whatever? Uh, you have to go You have to go through ownthe-training.com. Okay, so I'll send you an email. You'll get all of it. Go to on the dash, own own the dash dash training training dot com. Com. Also, you are on Facebook, Daco- at Dakota Meyer. Mm-hmm. You're on the gram. The gram. At Dakota Meyer. 0317. And you're on Twitter at Dakota underscore Meyer. Meyer. Echo, anything else? That's it. Good to see you again, as always. So good to see you. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I know, oh, right? Damn, that even hurt me over here. Well, you know, he's a genuine guy. I like it. Good, good energy. <laughs> the intent know? of that was yeah. really rough. As he holds that knife there, yeah, kind of odd. Dakota, kind of anything odd. else? Any closing, closing thoughts? No, thank you for having me on. It's always good to see you. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, thanks for coming back. And thanks for coming back, and thanks for continuing to try and help make all of us a little bit better. I know every time I, every time I hear you, every time I talk to you, I feel like you're making me a little bit better. And, you know, more important, thanks for your, for your service, and, and thanks for setting the example thank for you. the next generation. The next generation. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I appreciate you answering the calls. Appreciate you answering the phone. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. It's an honor. It makes me nervous, <laughs> but it's an honor. Um, you know, but the the next generation of sailors, soldiers, airmen, marines, they need to have people to look look to. And you're you're that guy. I and that. Um, to those to those that are out there right now, that are protecting us on the front lines around the world, protecting our most sacred gift, which is freedom itself. Okay. Thanks for holding the line. And, and to our people in uniform here at home, and we know who those are, that's police and law enforcement, that's firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers and border patrol and secret service, all the first responders. Yeah. Thank you for being there when we call 911. And everyone else out there, remember that life is hard and no matter who you are, you're going to face challenges. You're going to face vicious challenges at some point. You're going to be let down and you're going to let people down. You're going to have failures and then you're going to have more failures. You're going to be uncomfortable and you're going to be alone and every one of you out there. All of us, we're going to lose somebody that we love. That's the way life is. That's what life is. And through all of that, 
just remember that you have to get up. Remember to give thanks for what you do have. Remember to give thanks for what you can do. And remember that your worst day is someone else's dream. And like Dakota says, our last living legacy is a tombstone. And that tombstone has your name and it states the day you were born and it states the day you died. But what really matters is that little dash in between. That's your life. That is your life. So go out there and live it. And until next time, this is Dakota Meyer and Echo and Jocko.